Good morning. Uh, this is Tom Gardner again on our second day in Tucson uh, discussing uh, tape history with uh, a number of folks from IBM Tucson laboratories, most of whom who worked at IBM Boulder Labs beforehand. Um, we'll start with the three panelists today introducing themselves, starting with our host, actually, uh, the retired IBMer owner of WordPress and the person who made these facilities available to us, Joe Levine. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my life history in a few words or less. I was born in Troy, New York, November 1937. Grew up in Albany, except for a couple years during the war. We had a move, came back to Albany, graduated high school there. All through high school, I was working in a hardware store. And one day, this Marine comes in the hardware store for something or the other, and we got talking, and he told me I ought to really join the Marines. I gave it some thought. And, you know, a week or so later, I went down to see him at the Marine recruiting place, and he was out at lunch, because it was my lunch hour, too. But there was this Navy recruiter across the hall and down a little bit. So after four years in the Navy, <laughs> uh, and uh, when I went in the Navy, they give you these, or they gave me these aptitude tests, and they said you ought to be in electronics. And I went, huh? What? But those of you who are familiar with being in the service understand how that all works. Uh, so. That's what I did. I got out of the Navy in January 1960 and went back to Albany. And somebody said, there's a place down the road in Kingston that's probably hiring guys with electronics experience. I said, who's that? IBM. Who? What? So I drove down to Kingston, went in, applied for a job. And they said, oh, no, we don't need you. And somebody said, go down to Poughkeepsie. You know, somebody was like standing there. So I went across the bridge and down the road, Poughkeepsie, and they hired me. So I started work in Poughkeepsie in March 7th, 1960, uh, as an assembler. And we were assembling resistors on pluggable units. Okay, I hope everybody knows what those are. And uh, did that for a while, and then about that time, the 729 tape drive was just taking off. And they said, we need a bunch of people on the assembly line on the 729. You, you, and you. So there I was, assembling 729 tape drives on second shift. And I got hired for $2.25 an hour plus 10% shift premium. So I was living pretty high. Um, so we started assembling 729s, and um, they were so busy, we ended up working 12-hour days, six days a week. They could not make enough 729 tape drives to save themselves. And that went on and on and on for quite a while. Uh, in the middle of that, uh, got married. Last week was our 55th wedding anniversary. Uh, my Could wife, I can throw a plug in for my wife here. When I met her, she had just started being a kindergarten teacher. She had gone to Syracuse, graduated, and uh, she retired a couple of years ago as a professor at the U of A. She worked her way up through the ranks, became a doctor, got her doctorate, and uh, ended up as a, a professor at the U of A and retired a few years ago. Anyway, we worked long hours building 729s. One day, a guy named Bob Riley, okay, who worked in the lab. Sweet old Bob. Sweet old Bob. Uh, came in, and he, those of you know Bob, I can't imitate him real good. You know, he walked around, and, what are you doing, what are you doing, and all this and that. You know, he's a bully kind of guy, and I don't mind saying that. And I was a wise-ass young kid, 
So I said, who are you? What do you want? And I gave him a little bit of my lip, which I used to do fairly well. And um, he came back a couple weeks later and he says, I want you to come work for me in the lab. And I said, why? You know, <laughs> what do I know? So anyway, I ended up working in the lab for Bob Riley for a while. And we were working on the 7340 Hypertape, okay, which came in a cartridge, yay big, yay thick, two reels mounted in a cartridge. Worked on that for quite a while, okay, and from there uh, got transferred to Boulder in 1966. We moved to Boulder, worked on head development for quite a few years in Boulder. Uh, in 1977, I went to Hursley, England for a year. Okay, basically the full year 1977. Moved to Hursley in January. It rained right after the holidays. It rained every day in Hursley. Okay, not pouring rain, but just light drizzle, but rained every day in Hursley till about the first of February. And I look out and there's people walking around the street. It's still gray, overcast, wet. And I'm saying, oh, look, it's a great day. It's not raining. And I had a different reference point, so that I learned a few things there. Came back to Boulder, uh, worked on the Sprat, the floppy disk drive. Came back to Boulder with some of the people from England, and we worked on that for a while till it died, got killed. Uh, and then in November of 1978, I was made the Saguaro program manager. A little interesting tidbit on how I got that job. Uh, Jack Wells and I were both working for Bob Mazza at the time, and Jack was in charge of the Saguaro 3480. He walks up to me and he says, I'm going to Charlotte, you take over the 3480 just like that. Looked at him sort of funny, like this is an unusual way to learn about a new job. And I said, okay, and he walked his way, and I just sort of stood there and was thinking about it all. And a little while later, Bob Mazza comes up to me and he says, did Jack tell you that I want you to take the place over? I said, yeah. He said, okay, you got it. So anyway, that's how I got the job. Um, worked on the 3480. Um, through announcement, and then right after announcement, uh, I moved over into manufacturing uh, as a tape products manufacturing manager. Uh, saw it through first customer ship along with all the other products. Went to Yarfala and um, Valencia, Spain, uh, helping them get set up so they could make their <coughs> first customer ships. Um, did all that, and then in January 1988, Glenn Larnard, who was the site manager at the time, uh, asked me to come work for him. Okay, did that, and uh, was put in on this big secret at the time. Your job is to figure out how we get rid of a few thousand people here over the next few months. And uh, so we announced the workforce reduction in June of 78. You may want to check that date. I think I'm right. Uh, June of 78. No, of 88. 88, thank you. June of 88. Um, did that through till April of 89, and I retired. Oh, you got on that? I helped write it. Uh, and <laughs> yes, <laughs> and um, so I retired in April of '89. Started West Press January of '91. In between '89 and '91, just a little side tidbit: Carmen Rosado was on the board of directors for a company here in Tucson called Wyco, a uh, optics company. And he said, "Joel, you got to go help them out. There are all these." You know, Carmen, they need help. So I said, I'll do it, but that's not really what I, wasn't in my heart. I always wanted to own my own business. So I said, I'll do it for a short time, and I did. And 
you know, blah, blah, blah. End of story. Okay. Uh, first of all, the dates on the 3480, uh, was it when you started and when you ended? I started on the 3480 in... When uh, Mazda shit. left? No. No? Well. Um, I started on 3480. Here's the announcement. November 5th, 1980. Okay. You can have it. We would very much like that. And you stayed on it then? Through announcement Please. and first customer ship. Which was? First customer ship was in January, January. of... 85. Uh, 85. That's my understanding also. Your uh, wife's maiden name. My wife's, wife's maiden, maiden name. name. Kaskel. K-A-S-K-E-L. Okay, and where's her parents from? Uh, Poland. Poland. Uh, I don't know where in Poland. Okay. Uh, I might suggest you... you uh, for your grandchildren's sake, you ask your wife what town in Poland her parents might have come from, because it may not be in Poland today, maybe in Ukraine. I, yeah. <laughs> which is actually my history and, and a problem, which is why I raise these questions in, okay. in this uh, meeting. And your parents? Um, my father died when I was pretty young. Um, I was 14. My father died, um, and uh, my mother lived till she was in her early 70s. And they were from? Um, my mother was from Troy, New York. That's where they immigrated to. And um, she lived there, and then she moved in with us as she got older. Immigrated from? Uh, Russia someplace and I don't know where and it may not be in Russia <laughs> uh, yeah. and your father was also an immigrant no us? he was actually my father was born in New Jersey okay Trenton New Jersey I can't tell you why and so is the aptitude test that led you to uh, electronics engineering well, you, you come out of the Navy as a C-Tech I think is the uh, as an electronic technician yeah uh, that must have been a, in those days, that must have been an interesting program. It was program. very, oh, the Navy was good. I mean, I had this terrible assignment. I was aboard a ship for three and a half years. Uh, the ship was home ported in Villefranc, France, which is in between Monte Carlo and Nice, in case you don't know where it is on the coast there. So we had to live in France for three and a half years on the coast. And I was going to re-enlist on that point because it was good living there, you can't argue with that. And uh, I was talking to one of the officers and he was trying to convince me to re-enlist. I said, do I stay here in Lord Chip? He's no, no, part of the deal, we've got a movie. I said, thanks anyway, bye. <laughs> it was the end of that. Uh, what did your dad do? He worked for the local power and light company. Okay. Yeah. Technician, management? He was uh, in the bookkeeping department. Okay. Uh, children? I got a uh, daughter and her husband and my grandkids. They live here in Tucson, and a son lives out in Dublin, California. Works for Ericsson out there, network folks. Mm -hmm. um, he was one of the uh, original people that went to work for Cisco, okay, after he graduated college. Worked for Cisco for quite a few years, and uh, Ericsson stole him away, however that works out there. And uh, he's, he's okay, he's doing it right. Uh, anything you'd like to share about the, uh, or state, <laughs> about the workforce reduction? That must have been a trying experience. It, it was. Um, Actually, the majority of that work, Glenn Larner did a lot of it. I helped him with it. Um, all the negotiating with folks back east um, probably wore out more than one pair of trousers sitting on the airplane, um, going back and forth. Uh, 
but it was it was all new ground. I mean, we had never the company had never done anything like that before, and um, and nobody was quite sure what you could do, what you couldn't do, what you could get away with, what you couldn't get away with. Maybe get away is not the right word, uh, but what you could do, and um, we just tried ideas out and bounced them off the folks back east. And you know, a lot of us, no, you can't do that. That's terrible. And you say, well, what's your choice? You know, I mean, if you're serious about reducing the company, um, and uh, so we worked out the package that turned out to be, a, I think, a fair package, no, especially if you look at. It was hard to tell it was fair at the time. If you look at what's going on today, it was a very fair package. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this is a question. I think John probably went through that. Uh, oh, yes. How about Al? Were you through it too? Through which the, the, the reduction. That one? Yeah, that one. No. Okay, so maybe you'll give you a chance to talk about the sure. reduction too Ed, when we go into John's. Uh, uh, what was behind it? Why, why did they have to have the reduction? There was a point where they came to, by the way, it was also in Boca Raton, okay? There was two sites, okay, and it, they were running in parallel. Now, Boca only reduced by, I think, 16, 1,800 people, somewhere in that range. I may be off 100 here or there, but in that range. Um, but they were a smaller site to start with. And then we went down, I think, 28, 2,900 people. Um, and I think it was well presented to the employees. I think in ma the majority of the employees accepted it, you know. Uh, there's always some that didn't, but uh, I think the majority did. Um, it wasn't The announcement day wasn't a good day. Um, got through that a little bit, and uh, it all happened. Yeah. I was more interested in that question in the business causes, in your view, behind the reduction. And Let me offer some perspective, maybe. Um, okay. I joined IBM in 78, and I'll be introduced in a minute. When I joined IBM, IBM was a $40 billion company. It was about a $1.3 billion business, so we were a good solid 5% mind share. Uh, desk and tape were big wigs when I joined the company. And I don't remember if one of these guys will correct me, it was either Opal or Acres who had a vision of growing IBM to be a $100 billion company yeah. rapidly. And the uh, pointy heads back in New York decided that IBM, in order to uh, accommodate that type of a growth plan that we needed to build a massive amount of infrastructure. They built Tucson, they built Boca, I think they may have built a couple more, I don't remember when Manassas and Burlington were built exactly. I'm just kind of helping you remember right. what that was like. And they had in 78 probably one of the biggest hiring booms in the history of the company. They hired thousands and thousands of kids like me out of college. And long story short, the hundred billion dollar plan did not happen. happen. And 10 years after this massive infrastructure uh, expansion, uh, frankly, the corporate financial picture was not looking very good. Uh, we as good employees have been taking opinion surveys annually every year of our career saying, do you believe if you do a good job that you'll be employed for life, answering yes to that year in and year out. Uh, it was a very difficult decision. I had a friend uh, at the time who was in, who had a front seat, a fellow named Steve Ward. You probably remember Steve. Um, and I remember him calling me saying that they had made this decision and that it was probably the most painful decision that had ever been made at the corporate level. Uh, there are three ways to uh, facilitate a legal uh, reduction in workforce. One is called performance. One is called uh, staff reduction by school group and one is called uh, Elimination of Mission. And after a lot of debate, it was concluded that the first line managers, of which I was one that had to implement this, uh, were not going to do so voluntarily, so we have to force them. So we all got a little piece of paper with the people that we were to let go. 
it was based on the average uh, twice, two times your last appraisal, but your uh, blah, blah, blah performance formula. We had psychiatrists roaming the hallways. We had security people roaming the hallways. We were concerned about postal incidents. Well, we didn't have anything that bad, but we had a lot of people running out of the building, screaming, crying, sobbing, as Joel says. It was a difficult day, and the only reason my perspective is that it, it, it dovetails because I was the first line guy doing it, and uh, Joel was way up there, kind of watching me do it. <laughs> and and your perspective then it was the over expansion in general. That's of my I, IBM. That that we put this huge infrastructure okay. in one, one and, at a time. Okay, sir. So and now and Al Rizzi. I can, I can, I'll be introduced also later, but I can add just one element to that, I think, is that when they decided the mission, they, they looked at, they had a brand new facility at the IBM plant site, which had, was an asset in itself. By getting manufacturing out, and they had, they had enough manufacturing capability other places, so they basically moved the manufacturing to other facilities. And then they had this big site that they were able to, to turn over, which they actually did, as you, as you probably all know. So that was also part of why I think Tucson got hit so hard. I and mean, it was, it was the, basically the whole manufacturing mission went away. The development mission pretty much stayed but cut. Uh, and we had both software and, and, and development and activity which continued on, but at a much less you know, resource level. We had, we had excessive manufacturing capacity. That was very obvious. In IBM. Right. I mean, the, the simple fact, if you take a 3480 and its footprint, you put two drives where you used to put one. So now you need half the space to manufacture a 3480 than you did a 729 or seven, uh, 3480. Okay. So we had excess capacity, and that just over the years, obviously, you know, what we having our cell phone and we used to take a room full of or more of space. So So it was a combination that's a of combination of, of a lot of things. The 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 financial part that John's talking about is obviously a major factor. And what Al mentioned, it was a very sellable site. Being as new as it was, okay, it's I don't want to say anything bad about Endicott, but it's easier to sell Tucson than Endicott, okay? Or you couldn't sell San Jose with all the stuff you guys stick in the ground. So um, it was a it was a sellable site. That's another major factor in how it was determined which site it was. So and Al mentioned everybody knows about the sale, except I don't. So who did it get sold to? I think you mentioned in Al. Yeah, uh, what we did was we did a uh, seller financed deal with the University of Arizona uh -huh. and uh, basically our rent equaled their mortgage. We all sold it the only effect it had, and I, I hope I'm not talking too out of school here, uh, was that about a half a million dollars a year disappeared from the uh, Vail uh, tax base because the University of Arizona doesn't pay taxes. Uh, there were people that came out of the woodwork uh, protesting that and somehow that issue just silently went away. Okay. I don't know how. <laughs> we also sold but we also uh, gave them a free high school <laughs> on the site. So the site became known today as the te at Technology Park, the University of Arizona Technology oh, Park, and there's startups in there. There's IBM has a piece, Raytheon has a piece, and a whole bunch of little startups. Okay. And it's kind of funny now because you go to the what used to be the cafeteria and you'd see everything from high school students to one-star generals visiting Raytheon and sitting at adjacent tables, and it was actually a lot of fun. We did not. Did we sell the, the building ten to three M? We sold office? the first uh, divestiture was selling right. building ten, which was our media manufacturing facility that Rick probably spoke about in handy. We sold it to three uh, M. Right. Later they spun that out as Imation, and that sale had some interesting stories around it. Uh, yes. Uh, we had something called a utility plant, and that IBM, the original IBM facility, was almost a self. It was a city. We had 17 wells, we pumped well water, we had our own recycling, we had a million gallons of diesel fuel and a pad with jet engines that could keep the thing running 24 by 7. We were next to a railroad spur in case Tucson got blown away. Tennis courts. 
tennis courts, recreation facility, uh, 24 by 7. It was like a city with 6,000 people in it. It was weird at night, eerie. Um, one thing of note is that at that time in 78, Tucson was one of three strategic targets in the United States. Tucson was circled by ICM, ICBM missile launch sites dug into the ground. And there was another one somewhere in Kansas, I think, and there was a third one somewhere. Third one, which stops. And those, all those ICBMs were pointed at Russia. This was Cold War era. So there was concerns about uh, Tucson in a generic sense, which is why this shiny, beautiful, award-winning site was kind of bulletproof. In theory, you know, uh, Tucson gets blown away, we all just go to work and stay there. <laughs> They had showers. They had <laughs> everything we needed. We even Continue had our. To fill we even the, the cafeteria space. workers were IBMers <laughs> in those days. The the people mowing the grass were IBMers. It was just a whole different era. And uh, I don't know. This is kind of fun stuff to talk about. But uh, actually, I think it's great stuff to talk about. I really appreciate your elaborating on it. Uh, so I think that pretty much uh, continues. Joel, would you like to put a plug in for West Press? I understand one of the best uh, Southwest printing companies. No, I'll, I'll let. I'll let's stick with IBM. I will put a plug in for IBM. I I worked there almost thirty full years. Uh, I met and worked with a fantastic group of people uh, who continue to put a smile on my face. Uh, I thought it was an outstanding company to work for, some fantastic people, and they were all good years. Thank you. Okay, so I think to uh, Joel's uh, right, my left, and probably in IBM chronological order, not necessarily <laughs> physiological chronological order, He's uh, wise too, I didn't realize. We have Al Rizzi. <laughs> yeah, hello, my name is Albert Rizzi, and I, I was the tape products functional manager at the time of the, of the uh, announcement of the 3480. Uh, I joined IBM in 1965 after graduating from San Jose State with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. And I continued with IBM until 2002 when I retired, and that was 37 years. When I, when I joined IBM, I looked forward because of a lifetime commitment that we expected. I said, well, I think I'll be able to work 37, 38 years, because then you think, thought of 65 as your retirement. Well, I came close. I made it to 64. Um, and um, so that it was a long career. The uh, 3480 was, it was a, a one or two year time frame of my, uh, of my career, about halfway through the career. Um, I, education-wise, I also received a, by working at, uh, by going at night school, I got an MBA from the University of Santa Clara while I was still working. I got that in 1973. Um, I'm a California native, born in Gilroy, which is the capital of uh, the world, they say, um, and um, grew up, I uh, moved to a few places with my dad. My dad was a railroad foreman. They call them Gandhi dancers back east. So that basically, he had the the uh, uh, a crew that basically kept the railroads tracks going. They have what they would call them section foremen. They had a section that they had to take care of, and lived down in Goleta, down by Santa Barbara. Then we uh, then we moved uh, to Hollister when I was five or six years old. Started went through all of my sco uh, schooling basically in Hollister. But a year before I was going to graduate from high school, my dad, I think, in, for my benefit, uh, thought that living in Hollister, which is a real small town, about 3,000 people at the time, high school was, I don't know, 600 people total for all four years, uh, thought that he should try to get to me where there might be some, you know, some opportunities. Uh, and, he, and he bid on a job in, uh, in San Jose, got a job in San Jose. We moved there in the middle of my junior year. Uh, went to the, finished uh, high school in, at Willow Glen, it's where I met my wife. She was, her name is Kathleen, at that time Staples, uh, and uh, met her when she was a senior. I had already graduated. Um, when I, when I uh, prior to graduation, I had enrolled at San Jose State University, so that would have been, I graduated in 56, I would have been going at 56. Um, 
my dad was uh, came from an Italian family, and I think that he didn't really encourage me to go to college. It was kind of like it's time to go to work and bring some money into the family. I think that's the way he thought. He'd been working long enough. I should help the family. So he didn't really encourage me. And uh, about that time, General Electric, uh, Atomic Power Equipment Division, moved into San Jose. And, and my, one of my counselors, um, I was very good in math, and I was good in drafting and that kind of stuff, because you take those type of classes in, in high school. One of my counselors came to me and says, uh, GE is hiring. Uh, and you might want to consider, you know, uh, interviewing, going, going there. Uh, and I was planning, when I was at State, I was planning to become a teacher. That was my, at that time, I said, well, I'll become a teacher. And because when, when I was in high school, I tutored kids and such that weren't doing well. And uh, so I thought I had an ability to teach. So. So I go to General Electric, and they, uh, I got hired on as a, as a <coughs> draftsman trainee. They, uh, General Electric had a great apprentice program back east, and is it uh, not in, uh, it's, I can't think where they, exactly where General Electric is. Schenectady. Schenectady, yeah, because they had just moved out from Schenectady. And the people that came were, were part of the apprentice, of their apprentice program there, the drafting and design and that kind of stuff. So I got in and, and became a drafting trainee. And that, that training actually stood well for all of my career. Because I became a mechanical engineer. And over that time, I was able to use that, that training and drafting design throughout the whole process. You could read drawings. <laughs> One of the things that you learn. But anyway, so, uh, so I said, well, I'll take that job. So I did take that job. And I, was, I worked there for about a year and a half, went through their program. And, and then they were going to go through a layoff. Lockheed had just come into town. And Lockheed was going to hire, and, and I, uh, General Electric was going to uh, lay off. And Gen uh, General Electric was also was pretty good at handling their people, caring about their people. <clears throat> so what they did is they, got, they put together a list of the people they were going to lay off and brought, brought in recruiters from Lockheed, gave them the list, set up the people to interview with them. I wasn't on that list. They wanted to keep me. And I said, you know, th these guys are getting pretty good offers. So I said, well, can I talk to these guys? <laughs> so I went and talked to them. They, they, I guess, you know, they're, they're smart enough people. They, they said, this guy's not on the list. Maybe we should hire him. So yeah, I ended up going to work for Rocky. And, uh, and uh, I, during this time, I'm dating my wife. And we, and we ended up getting married when I was 20. I was, I was working at Rocky. Uh, we have which part, can I ask which part of Lockheed they were? Lockheed really? Missile Space Division. Missile Space Division. There are two Lockheed Divisions in the Bay Area. Yeah, Missile Bay Space Area. Division. It's, they were located in Sunnyvale. And I went to work as a designer, draftsman designer. And I and, uh, can't remember exactly. I, I went to uh, work at General Electric in 56, and probably was 57, late 57, 50, early 58, I went to Lockheed. And about three years, one more. This is the, the Polaris part the of Polaris. Lockheed. Polaris. Well, I was working on the Polaris missile. This has been described as a startup with nuclear weapons in the Bay Area. Is that right? Well, I, was, I worked on that, uh, and uh, and I was I worked in what they call checkout systems, and, and that was the that basically they monitored the the system prior to you know shooting it in the air, uh, you know out of the sub, etc. But. But anyway, I, I worked on that, and, and I, I got to the top of my rank in about two years as far as pay. And, my, and I had electrical engineering ma uh, manager, I guess you might call him a mentor, because he, his name was Gail Lewis, as I remember. And he said, you know, you've got to go to college. You, you, you've got the capability. You should just go to college. And well, San Jose State was right there in town. So, so I said, well, maybe I should do that. So I took one, night, one, year, uh, one year of night classes see whether I could still, could still pass classes. And then I enrolled, you know, I quit my job. My wife was working at Ames at that time. Ames Research is right, right adjacent there. And then later she worked at Lockheed herself because she was a math aide, mathematician type stuff. And so I went, then went off for four years uh, work, uh, going to school at San Jose State. So it was from 61 to 65 when I went. During that time I also worked at, uh, I, put myself, you know, help put myself through school. I worked about 75% full time while I was going to college. I worked at a company called Explosive Technology, which made the destruction 
uh, things for the the Apollo missiles, you know, the space the spacecraft, the ones that would blow it up if they had a self-destructive. So I worked there uh, basically for four years. Uh, graduated, and uh, they wanted me to stay full time with them then. But, but I was always a little bit afraid of explosives, and they were moving up to uh, up close to Sacramento, by, uh, actually where you actually lived at one time. Yeah. Um, I remember the name of the town. Um, but anyway, so but I, I also interviewed with IBM and General Electric, and. Uh, and decided that IBM was probably the best one to go for. A lot of people always thought of IBM as a, as a electrical engineering company. But I realized that they, it was significant mechanical engineering challenges to work with. So I, I joined uh, IBM 65 as a design engineer. And, it was, uh, and basically, back in those days, you know, we didn't have computers that could draw on, et cetera. You, know, you, you drew with a I guess we had those mechanical mm -hmm. uh, arms and such, but um, so I worked on board as a design engineer, and I was doing uh, tape cartridges. My very very first, uh, I was both uh, cartridges for a for a printer uh, for excuse me for a image projector, and then also we had an analog tape as part of the education systems, which we and we shipped that product as fifteen twelve image projector and then the 1506 tape product. I learned I, IBM system at that time because back then we did what they call an ABT, uh, an A test, a B test, and a C test. The A, the a test was basically a, a, a verification test, equivalent to an EVTs. Excuse me, I'm Yeah, for what it's worth, my recollection is it was Digital Equipment Corp that actually drove the language change in the industry from ABC test, system ABC test, to EVT, DVT. Who, who, who DEC. It was well, selling we, OEM to DEC. We, we wouldn't know. Who cared? No, it was selling OEM to DEC. <laughs> we wouldn't have cared at that time. <laughs> well, it's, it's sort of interesting. There was a change in the language. Oh, I, don't, I, I have recollect nothing that says it was that. And uh, my... I think what happened is we had A test, B, te uh, and B test, and C test, and the, and the A test was basically just a rid kind of the conceptual. We'd build engineering, would build about two or three, four models, put it in, in, see whether it was working all right, uh, and if it was, that we would then advance the product to the next stage. And, and, and between A test and B test, you could do major changes uh, of, the, of the of the mechanics or the of electronics. Uh, and then, uh, at that time, you would you would get in manufacturing kind of a pilot line type activity going, where they were involved with building the you know you'd start releasing drawings to them and they they would start building product to your specifications. So it was kind of the B test was at that time a kind of a pilot line, you know, validation I would say. Then and then, if you got through that test. That was really the announced was really the announced test capability. Uh, usually announced after a B test, not after an A test. And um, and then they would go into a production run. That was the C test, and that was your ship verification test. You couldn't ship unless you got through that test. But you'd already announced the product. Over time, uh, which is aside from my you know private experience, over time, IBM shortened the cycle. Because the cycle, that type of cycle is long. Because you've got, you, you know, you're, and so we were trying to shorten the cycle. So as part of shortening the cycle, you have to be, basically you get in your announcement verification uh, and your DVTs. And so we basically changed the, the mm -hmm. length of time and the type of testing we were doing through that process. Yeah. And I can't remember really where that was. I know that, because uh, I'll, I'll follow on with my, my discussion. So I was working on the 1500 system. We, we did that couple of projects, got to understand the A test, B test, and, and my responsibility as, a, as I gathered more responsibility in that job was to take both these products through that testing and get them qualified, <clears throat> which I did. And then I uh, was uh, moved on from there to Winchester. Winchester was already uh, uh, as a program. You know, your programs get put in place the, you establish how many resources you need, your schedules, and you have to recruit people. Often, you don't just come in with a full staff, so you recruit some people. And I got recruited by Dick and Gilvani, who was probably one of the key conceptual guys, along with, you know, he, he worked for 
for Houghton at, at the time. But Mulvaney was one of the key thinker type guys that we had in those time frames. So I went to work for Mulvaney. And, uh, and I, my job at that time was to design, the, the, again, this was the, uh, I designed the head arm assembly, the, you know, the four head, head arm assembly, the carriage structure that, that it, where we attached it. And that's why I know A test and B test were different because the, the A test model and, the, and the, what we put in as part of the ship, the, the, whole, the whole way we attached was different. The load mechanism, I'd also designed the load mechanism because that was an HDA that you had a couple to a VC, a voice pro motor. Uh, and I was responsible for that, that, that mechanics. And um, the first design we had, which was actually one off, was kind of based on what Dick Mulvaney had, had us do. Uh, the door, you know, if you recall on, on Winchester, that module, you had to open a door. Well, the first model, the A-test model, we pulled the door sideways. It was a flat front. We pulled the door sideways as we went in. Well, that, that thing was cocked. causing every, you know, we basically you had forces going this way when you're trying to move things forward. And at the same time, you had a couple, this thing, a uh, couple of the, uh, what do call it, voicemail uh, actuators out to the back of the carriage. So between ATS, that just didn't work well. So I, I redesigned that and went and said, look, as we're going forward, everything should be part of a motion forward. So we designed a cam system that basically controlled all the timing of this thing. That basically, when the, as we were going forward, part of the motion forward was we were pulling the door down. So the, the door, instead of going sideways, became a door that went down. And it had a curvature to it so that it, we could close it. And then you had the coupling mechanism. The, Big challenge of those type of uh, things was actually getting your carriage attached to the back of a and 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 holding a gap so that you weren't touching with your voice coil to the to the uh, so I worked on that. We uh, 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 Mulvaney was a great man. I don't know if any of you guys you know Mulvaney, right? Uh, but he wasn't a real good manager because he was he was more of a theorists they had ideas and just always had ideas. Well, you have to cut off ideas sometimes and move forward with what's going to work, not keep improving things. But uh, and so um, Chris Cloris was the working for Houghton. Chris Cloris was the program manager. Houghton would be, I guess Houghton was really the program manager. Chris was the engineering manager. Chris brought in Jim Gilmore as the manager and structured two uh, managers, first line managers, one of them, one, uh, under him, and I was one of them. So I became a first line manager, working on Winchester, as the responsible for basically all the mechanics, besides the HDA. The HDA was then put under Shell Alice, and so Shell had the had the HDA. Now I had already, I, I had the responsibility for the carriage and the ways and that and that part of the system. And we had we had some real good engineers that worked. And you, you remember Tom Patel? Yeah. Tom Patel did the did the design of the voice motor and that kind of stuff, and did all the dynamic analysis. So, so I became a first line manager. Shell Ellis took over as the, he took the HDA. I took the rest of the drive. We then got that product through and shipped, and we you know we got that out in pretty good time. We got that out in '75, in the '73. Yeah, we announced it, and I think we shipped it maybe the same year, it might have been 74. And, and we had, to, you know, as you're going through product, product development, you, you're you looking at what, I guess you call it a roadmap now. I don't know that we called it roadmaps back then, but you look at where are we going to go from here? What's the next thing? And it, part of it was because people wanted to keep their jobs, you know, they wanted to keep working, but they also were looking at it, you know, from a product point of view, where do you go? So we, we had work going on, and what could we do? Uh, for the next generation, and that was that turned out to be Madrid, uh, the, which was the fixed HDA, and we and part of the way you you know you looked at cost per megabyte and that kind of stuff, and there was performance elements that you had to worry about, but part of the way you get that cost per megabyte down was stack more disk, get more, get the overhead that you have to put into a product to support more capacity, and so we went from uh, Winchester, by the way, I think we had 30 megabytes on Winchesters, and I figured out what we even put on the grid, and those type of numbers. Actually, me. there were two modules, right, a 35 and a 70. You had the, the removable. I'm talking about Madrid. 
Oh, Madrid? 3350. I'm sorry, I was talking 3340. Yeah, the 3350, we, we basically took the same base casting. Um, I can't remember if we used the same bicycle motor or not. I know we, no, we would have had to put a different magnetic structure in there. And we stacked it now, uh, I think it was eight, eight arms high. And, uh, and we fixed, the, fixed it, both of it in basically. It was 317 and a half megabytes in that's right, the IBM yeah. format. Right. Yeah, that's what, that's the number. Yeah, you were in that. You took that in, at what do you call it? Oh. Uh, memory, right? You so, betcha. so, uh, so I had I was responsible for uh, the mechanical. Uh, uh, Bob Friesa took over as the engineering manager. Maybe he was a program manager. I think he was a program manager because I think Houghton moved on to something else at that time. And Chris Kaloris went over to do the 3880, no, 30, so the big printer, whatever that printer number was. We were having trouble getting our big printer out, and they moved both. Chris went over there and he pulls Jim Gilmore out, takes him with him. That leaves some openings for people like me. So I, I basically uh, went to work for Bob Friesen, who had the responsibility for the whole Madrid, but to do the servo and the electronics, et cetera. And I had the mechanical, the whole mechanical uh, design under me. Uh, one of the key engineers I had was Jim, uh, was Jim Lucky worked for me at that time. Uh, you guys probably know Jim. He's he's still I think he's still around. Uh, I see his name is still on the IBM stuff. He may may or may not be retired. Tom Patel and a few other guys. But um, then then so we we got the you know we got that product 3350 out in '75 and um, I'm trying to remember what Bob, what Bob did we. I, I proposed then the follow-on product to that was the 337075, and we were aiming at at the mid midway uh, mid systems, not the high end system. We did a fixed block version, and uh, we, I remembered flying and being in Herzl. In fact, talking with people because it was Piccolo was being going to be done back in that time, same time frame, and uh, the uh, we, we end up. So I proposed this particular uh, uh, approach, and I had worked with you know Tom Patel and others, and some of the recording channel guys, because we were, because when you develop a program, you have to understand what what commitments can be made by the technologists and the engineering type people, you know, that are, that are all putting that product together. But I proposed the 337075, got accepted. One was the fixed 3370 was a fixed block version, 3375 was a comfy data version. Uh, the fixed block was, I think, direct attached right to the, I can't remember what system we, we announced. Back in those days, we announced systems and, and, and peripherals at the same time. You know, we didn't, we didn't come, by, come out later and, you know, develop product. That we often announced the peripherals as part of a big system announcement. And so there was, uh, uh, the uh, fixed block uh, dev uh, devices were being done in, in Germany, I think, I think it may have been at Berbergen. Okay. Yeah. Could it be the system 38 was the first attachment of the fixed block 3370? I think system 38 was along with the, the product out of Ber, uh, Berbergen. Maybe that was the count key data one. Yeah. And the fixed block one may have been the system yeah. 38. I'm not, I can't remember to be honest. It, there's there's uh, a rumor in the industry that the uh, system 38 being fixed block was the only FS system to make it to market. Future Systems, which IBM was doing in the mid 70s and then canceled about that time. I, I no, can't, no, no I comment, can't, huh? I can't validate that kind of rumor. I don't know. Okay. I, 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 you, know you, get, you get involved with work in your, your space and pushing it. So we did the 7075, 337075, and uh, Carmer's Auto. I had just got back from uh, a uh, Sloan program at MIT. Became the manager, the, the uh, what I was called the product manager. So he had the business planning and the, and, the, and and more than one product. I can't remember. For, yeah, he, he would have had the 3880. I mean 3380 uh, at that time. So he had he had products and and the 75. We actually put out the thin film head that was being developed for the. 3380 prior to the before they could get the broad and 3380 had been in development for a while before we ever even did this one. So we got we, I so I then worked on that product and uh, 
And I, Carmen uh, recommended me to, for the, the Sloan program. And, and, and I was uh, selected. I thought I was going to go to MIT, where he was. I figured IBM would send me away. They sent me to Stanford, which, I, which is, uh, was great for me. Yeah. Full disclosure, in June of 1980, you and I met as I was an outgoing Sloan Fellow and you were an incoming Sloan Fellow. <laughs> I suspect you're right. I, right? I, I, I can't remember that, that I had yeah, met pretty, you. I'm pretty sure yeah, we... Yeah, because we, we, yeah. we, we had that joint meeting where they introduced all of us. Yeah. And, uh, and there was, in fact, there was a, an IBMer that I, that I knew was in that class. He was a, a lawyer, right? Marshall Phelps. Marshall Phelps. Who uh, probably collected all the royalty money that uh, Rick was talking of. Marshall went on to become the uh, person at IBM who set off the uh, program to collect royalties on all its patents in beginning around 79, uh, yeah, around, around, I think 1990. It's about 10 years after, after Sloan. That was, in it. that was Marshall's, Marshall Phelps. So I, um Worked on worked on that project, seventy seventy five, and, uh, and prior to that, but from an education point of view, I, I, when I got up, when I got out of school, I wanted to immediately go to an MBA program at Santa Clara, and Donaldson, who's on that career doc, you know career, uh, uh, they call it brochure I have there, uh, was my manager. He said, "No, no you got to work for a while. I got to make sure that you're okay." So they didn't want to basically commit to spend money. So I said, well, I'll take the I See, IBM back then had a superior education, internal education. So I took, a, I took the equivalent of a master's degree in electrical stuff. I took logic, I took programming, I took all these things that, that they offered. And Ken Uchi even taught. Remember Ken? Ken? I remember taking a class from Ken Uchi. And stuff. So I, for that year, I took, all, I took every class I could. Then I went on for the MBA. But also during this, this time frame, IBM will, would, would periodically select people they thought had some growth uh, capability and send them off to pretty good education opportunities. So I went to Sands Point for about three weeks. I was in, as I recall, I was in New York on, on, on Long Island in, a, in somebody's Guggenheim uh, mansion or somebody's like that. And sitting right up on a hill looking both ways out over to New York. Spent about uh, three weeks there. And one of the guys uh, that I was... Uh, uh, peer with at that time became the, the head of research. I can't remember his name right now, but he he ultimately became top guy as a young man. He was a pretty young guy. He was, uh, evidently, he was very very good. And there was a number of other ones I remember that they moved moved quickly. When you get into development programs, development programs eat your time. I mean, if you you go in and get committed to a product, I mean, Joel was five uh, four or five years of his career is getting that product out, fighting every, fighting every day with, with the kind of problems. Uh, and the, uh, so, so I, you know, I got the opportunity to go to some of these classes, uh, some of these classes. I went to, to um, one where I remember one of the, one of the guys that was in that class was from, C, uh, it was a CE. And so we had, this one was a class from people from all different, just, uh, what's that place where, Terrytown? Is that in New York, Terrytown? I think it was in Terrytown. I remember uh, ha ha rooming with this one guy. He was a, C uh, he was a CE, big guy. And I, I never wake up at night. This guy, I could not sleep. He snored so loud. It was unbelievable. I remember this guy very well. I don't remember his name, but I remember that. So I had opportunities uh, for a lot of education type stuff, uh, which which helps you in, in basically your basic management. Because those types of classes are, that they're trying to do is get you, they role play you, they, they, you know, they do things that kind of see what kind of management you're gonna be and they try to give you training for that. So I got selected to the Sloan program. I went to Stanford for a year, met some of the best friends you'll ever have through that process because the Sloan program, as you recall, is basically, it was at that time, I think we had 42 people. You have a room and the professors come to you, for at least for the first, for every class for the first quarter, then after that you start taking the MBA classes and you get some of, some of both. So, but you get, you get to know people that are just really, really skilled people. One of our, my peers was uh, 
was John Brown became the uh, chairman of uh, BP. He's the one that got moved out when when he had when he somehow it came out. You know, we all knew, but I don't and I don't know why somebody comes out when everybody knows something. But uh, he was he was a good friend and and uh, no guys you know from. As, as you know, from from uh, all all places, best that was the best experience I had at IBM. So, um, so then I uh, pr actually prior to going to the uh, to the Sloan program, I I ran a task force. I was actually asked by uh, Jack Harker, who you know well. Uh, Jack Jack had gone somewhere and saw a production line. And I guess he had a vision that says, we should be able to just off a production line, get HDAs and, and tailor them to different specifications, different capacity, different things like that. He had this vision, because he told me what his vision was when he asked me to run this task force. So then we put a bunch of people, you know, I don't know if you were on that one or not, on the sawmill one. Uh, but you know, you get, you, get, you get people from the technology groups, recording channel and, and, uh, and you know, from the, all of the areas, and you kind of just, you go through, what can we do? And we were trying to say whether we could do something like what Jack did. Well, out of that came the sawmill program, uh, which I think was what, the 93 <coughs> series, 93, 40s or something. I don't, I, but anyway, the, the sawmill, and Jim Nakayama, who worked for me on the, 90, on the 75, uh, he was the uh, servo engineering manager, as I recall. Uh, um, uh, he then took over that, uh, Mark Young then took over that program the, uh, and, and, and got it shipped. Prior to leaving the company, he left the company not too long after that, I think. But, um, so, so, I, you know, so I worked on that sawmill from that perspective. I didn't really work on it as to drive in it. Um, then, then after the Sloan program, Carmen Zotto, who name you may not have heard yesterday, but Carmen is common to Andy Gaudet, who, who told you about coming down here. He actually was brought down by Carmen also. Carmen, what, 1980, I think. I came down in 81 after graduating with the Sloan program. And, and there was a job that Carmen wanted me to take that he had kept over, open for about six months. I forget who he had in there. I think it was Bill Nelson. They moved Bill to something else. They left the job open for about six months. It was the man product manager of the storage subsystems. And, and so I came to, uh, uh, to Tucson as a product manager in 1981. Uh, and um, Billy Joe Mooney, who we haven't talked about here, but he was the, the program manager. He's one of these wild men. Did you know Billy? Sure. Billy Joe was really one of the, the great you know, guys that I think most people really liked. And they, could, and they, would, they would just put their heart out working for him. Uh, anyway, he, he had a, a product, the 3880, 3880 was our control, controller for the DASD, up in, and it was actually developed in San Jose, but they were doing a cache controller, so they put cache in front of it, and they would stage, uh, stage data from the, from the DASD so that you had quicker access times. Uh, and there was two, two models, one was a Mod 11 and one was Mod 13. We called them Ironwood and Sheriff at the time. Uh, Ironwood and Sheriff. I don't know why. It must be Billy Joe Mooney from here. Wore his boots you know, all the time. Uh, and and Mike Hartung, who was one of our uh, one of the key contributors at IBM during uh, at IBM uh, Tucson at that time, uh, was what, kind of the architectural brains of what we were doing back in those days. The fourth and the cash controller here. and. Uh, I think he, w he became one of the first STSM, was one of the first? Mm -hmm. In Tucson, he was the first STSM, the first fellow. The first fellow? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, he, you know, he was, you know, key to, key to what we were able to do back from the technology point of view. Of course, it takes a lot of engineers to basically do what the architects say you want to do. STSM? Senior technical staff member. Thank you. All right. And uh, so he was working for Billy Joe. And I also, at that time, they, I had, I had kind of a, really, a, a, I, in some way you might call it a kludge of a, to part of a product management responsibility. I was responsible for the 3880, you know, Mod 1113, the cache controllers, 
from a from a business point of view. There's no way I was responsible from a technical point of view, but Billy Joe was was the guy that drove things. So he liked Joe. You know, he was a program manager. He knew his team knew what he wanted and, and his commitments was what you got. I also had the performance analysis group for all of the tape, all of the products, which would have included tape and such. And I had I had the software group. I can't remember that guy's name that was from from Sonoida. And his wife worked in product test. They're, you can't remember either. So he, but anyway, he, uh, we, we had responsibility for the software for both for the printers that we were doing, and also we had a product called HSM, Hierarchical Storage Manager, which was under um, Al Johnson at that time. And, um, and so th that was in this, uh, in this group. Uh, I also had uh, the mass store, the 3850 product engineering requirement support. That was Clint Gaylord worked for me, and he came from Boulder with the product. Again, I, I, it didn't take any of my time to, to manage that because Clint was another one of these uh, uh, capable people, person that just knew what had to get done. And, and there were always some type of problems in the field with any of our products. And so you had a product engineering staff that, that supported that. So I had that, and uh, and of course the story we had the storage subsystem planning uh, responsibility. Jim McMillan, who you initially had shown on it, Jim McMillan was the uh, planning manager for that. It sounds like he's still in town. He never called me back. He's in town. Yeah, I got a word to him. Yeah. I don't, but I don't think he worked on the on the on the tape rod. But he was he was on a thirty eight eighty planning manager. Oh, he was on 348 also. Yeah, he was 348. Not during the time, he wasn't on during the time I worked on it because uh, down Dick Ruckvogel, I think you guys were saying, was Andy Hopper was actually the planning manager for the 3480 during that time. And I think Jim Klosmo either came in and worked for him or replaced him. I just can't remember. There's so a guy named Herb Day. Herb Day. Herb Day worked in the Hopper organization uh, during that time. Uh, you know, so there was there was a number of uh, you might call people who were business, real business planning people in this part of the management team. Uh, Colosimo and Hopper were managers, but I just I can't remember in my mind did, is is what, whether Colosimo was there at the time of announcement. Did Jim Colosimo work for Bob Shaft? No. Bob Shaft ran the uh, demo center, yeah. whatever the proper no. word is. Pretty sure he didn't know. No, no. Uh, so anyway, um, so on the on this, just this is. I hope this is the right kind of history you're looking for. But I, uh, so I had the responsibility for this this set of people, and one of, one of the groups was also I had real small evaluation group. We called it optical disc technology. So I had a group of guys that were evaluating what can we do with optical disc. It was it was clear that IBM wasn't going to be able to invest in one more technology. You know. But you know, where you're going to own the technology. So we were looking at, and the industry was ahead of us in, any, in optical disc technologies at that time. So what we did is we uh, signed a, a PhD, uh, and he, I guess he had, I had him as a manager, and he had about four or five people working for him. And we, and we basically were evaluating the different technologies. And I, I did some business trips with him. We went to Philips, we went to Sony and Mashusta and and uh, there may have been others that we that we evaluated. Um, we ended up ultimately doing some work out of that uh, with Mashusta on the, that 3363 um, product. But that's that's uh, in the future. So I had a I had a technology group on optical disc that was working for me. Um, Oh, and also I had a I had a, a manager and, and a team working on a, fo uh, a follow-on tape library for the mass store based on the 3480 tape cartridge technology. So we had a group that was actually physically doing design and such at that time. So, um, and uh, and uh, also I worked uh, with we put together a task force also. <laughs> That Hartung actually ran. I was, I was. It was my task force, but Hartung was the guy that was kind of a key guy to kind of help drive it. And and we basically established what we wanted to do with follow on to the, uh, the Ironwood Sheriff, and that was the mod 2123. I think that they were. I think that it was the next generation that we announced anyway. 
Um, and because uh, it because it was p apparent that you could do a lot with cash in, in front ends inside of controllers uh, with the DASD back <laughs> back as a back score or and people with foresight probably looked at it with the with uh, tape as the back score. But um, but anyway, we were we were that was the the, the role of that group, the storage subsystem. Then um, I think there was some management turmoil that happened uh, during this time frame that um, they had brought uh, my, uh, just a, a little bit of background <laughs> in history of the IBM and not necessarily my my story per se but background in IBM is I think uh, Rosado came to Tucson as, a, as the lab director and I and somewhere I saw that Phil Dauber may have been working for him. Well, no, Jack Wells. Jack Wells was working for him. Yeah. So Dauber, I guess Dauber probably. I think Dauber was the first lab director. Then then Carmen's auto came in. I don't know what happened to Dauber. He may have moved somewhere else. Or I'm not sure what anything about that story. But Carmen then brought uh, Andy down. He brought me down. He brought Bill Nelson down. Uh, and I'm sure he brought others that I can't tell you. you know. And he probably made a lot of money for the for the real estate agent that that he would introduce us to because we all bought how where when you come into town you're going to buy a house, and he introduced us to this one guy I can't remember his name anymore, but um, and and um, so Carmen was was the pro, uh, manager. Bob Mazda at that time was a product manager for the tape 3480. Joel I think uh, would have worked for uh, Bob Mazda at that time, and then. Carmen got promoted to general manager of, of the, the whole facility, uh, and uh, and Bob Mazza got promoted in in as as the uh, product manager, excuse me, lab director, and they brought in a person we can't remember the last name of, but Nick. Joel worked for him. His name was Nick something. He was a Russian. He came out of uh, Rochester, or went, and he went back to Rochester. I assume at some point. Quick. But but there was there was probably some conflicts within the management style, and and we were at, at, during those time frames we were having weekly me meetings with with the management from San Jose. The, pre the president would come down, and all of this, uh, Harry's and others would come down to find out what we we're doing. But anyway, so they decided uh, to change the, the management of the of the pro at the product management level. We didn't change anything below product management level. Uh, so I, I was brought over and asked to, to get it through the test. I had a reasonably good history of getting products, you know, through the process because the process is not just the the development DVT test; it's also the business aspect of it, getting people to accept what you're doing and being able to get the cost structures in place and et cetera to support the, uh, the business plans. But anyway, so I was brought over uh, as 3480, and I brought with me. The optical disc technology. So I was product manager of 3480, or it's actually at that time it'd be called Tape Product. Tape Product product manager. I, I brought over the, the the manager who I can't remember his name, who was developing the uh, the uh, library. So we had the library responsibility going, and it wasn't this big thing. Although it may be a, they may have uh, you know ended up going to that at some point. Um, but uh, the, so we had uh, that, I had the optical disk technology, and, and at that time Andy Hopper, from, from the planning point of view, then reported to me. So, um, let's see, so the, uh, that, and Jim Dennison was the, the, the person I was talking to about, that was the PhD that was doing the optical technology, and he, by that time he had all contacts all over the, in Japan and, 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 and in Phillips, and, and other places. Now, um, the um, the the uh, thing about the the oh, I call it management turmoil. In in my mind, I would think that in some way it might look like it was management turmoil because because we they, we that management at his that he was really important to change three times, maybe four times. Through the development of the product, they went, they went, you went you guys. exactly, yeah. And I and I was as I was, I kind of wrote up what I might say, 
I don't know, you know, Joel, Joel withstood all of us, you know. Maybe it was Joel that was causing the, the problem. You know, nobody could handle you, Joel. But uh, anyway, so um, the, the typical structure that back in those days, and it's probably different now, uh, and he, he, can, he can chime in if he likes. Uh, the typical structure was a lab director with a product manager reporting to him. That we had functional managers reporting to the lab director uh, that all, all came together to be able to, to bring a product out from a development engineering point of view. So the product manager uh, would have, typically would have the development manager working for him, which is, in, in this case, Joel was the product manager at 3480, who worked for a number of product managers prior to getting the product out. And, uh, and then you'd have functional managers who had the technology side, like Andy today, uh, and, uh, and, the, and also lab support. Then uh, Wayne, Wayne Winger was the last support. Now Wayne was a Wayne was a key guy through a lot of the tape. And and somewhere in the thirty four uh, in the Tucson world, I I only knew him as the as the uh, functional manager uh, handling basically the rest of the lab type stuff. Um, the uh, when you say functional manager, you mean things like. Product test or things like no, was, technology or was, uh, and the functional manager in our in our case was more like uh, technology. Like Andy Gooday had all the, he had the technology people working so, from, so you, and, it, and and a functional manager was would support more than one product. I mean, you might have multiple products that the, that the technology people were supporting. So you might have a say a recording channel department. In under the, under, under a the, functional manager, under a functional manager right. who supported all of the right. development and, you know, and often it was personality driven too. Sometimes a, a manager wanted this guy working for him, and so that happened. You know, so um, and um, so Mazza uh, was the lab director during the, the development, and it was uh, actually at the time that I, as I recall, that I became uh, the product manager, and then. Both Rosado and Mazza moved on, and um, the lab uh, lab um, director was became Jay Hassan. So Jay, I then reported to Jay Hassan. You reported to Jay Hassan. Phillips remembers reporting to Jay Hassan. Although at that time, Andy had all the technology, including the media. So I, I don't think Bill had the media. Full responsibility at that at that time. At some point he did, but you know we just changed things around. And uh, and uh, as I already said, Wayne was the was the lab support. And, and that that was I don't know that would be. I suspect we had lab support would have included um, the UL approvals, the uh, uh, the, the shops, the model shops, the model shops, uh, the so. So you know it was it would be areas that you needed to support a product that wasn't necessarily folded under the, the product manager because because products get canceled and you don't want to un have to undo your your support structure. Uh, so um, the uh, I went on after that to so I had this optical disc. And, oh, actually, I went over and I was in manufacturing for a while too. We were having troubles with the 3370. They had moved the manufacturing 3375 down to Tucson in this interim period while I had gone, and we were having starting to have uh, both production and field problems. And we had, and they had a group, uh, which is not normal, uh, of product engineering support working in manufacturing at the time. And so I was asked to go over and manage that group, and that included the 3310. The 3310 was was being uh, built here too, as I recall, and the and then the uh, 3375. So I worked on that for about a year. I think I worked uh, worked for for Harwood, remember Carl Carl Harwood, and uh, so I learned a little bit about the, man, the managing management of manufacturing. Their techniques are different than management of development. And then I, and then from there I went, I came back and I, uh, I, I did a uh, product called the 3360 optical disc product, 
Uh, the PS2 um, was was in development, and, and we wanted to put a high capacity back store uh, to to the PS2. And we worked with Mashusta. They had face change technology. It was uh, warm right once, read, read many times. So it's basically a uh, you know a permanent uh, archival type of media, at least in, that, in our minds, how we sold it. Uh, it was a it was designed both as a standalone box with attachment card that you could attach. Uh, could we attach? Uh, did the, we we did the software? I had a, I, when I put that together, we had about six guys. I had to build a build a team, and so we did the software file support for it. We did all the we drove all the evaluation and product test and DVT uh, with this team. I I got a little corner down at at, at the old. Uh, the old site that that IBM first came in here at, you know, down at the airport. I had, I had the best the best operation that you could have. I had, you know, my I had the whole staff within, you know, 100 feet or I'm not sure how many square feet we had, but we had labs and everything there. And uh, we were working with the Japanese on their on their. They were doing the technology. We were we were basically integrating their their technology into the products. And so I had to you know work with the uh, the PS2 guys, because we were going to direct attach the PS2. We were going to—it was a three, it was five and a quarter technology, and that and that technology we put right in into the box, um, where where, uh, and it was attached. We had to have an attachment card back in those days, uh, but it was done as a as a file in, in right into the PS2 box. In the case of the PCs, which we had what I forget the numbers that we had there, but three or four. XTs and things like that, ATs and XTs and so on. There was about three or four products that we had to attach. I remember that we did, couldn't attach the PC Junior, which I had one. That's the only PC I had. It was a PC Junior back in those days. And uh, and and so we developed that product, got it done in about, and I had to you know staff the whole thing up from scratch. And uh, you get you get people that don't want to work with other people, or other people don't want them working for them. Uh, Bill Burke worked for me. You know, you know Bill Burke, don't you? I knew that. Yeah, um, but he did the software. They drove the software, and I got them. But anyway, so we did that product, and uh, I think we got that on '87. Um, now that's the time frame you're going through the the lab production, right? Yeah. Uh, so I don't. So we I got that product out, and then we we were proposing. A, a library based on Mashusta's face change technology, which is rewritable at that time. And I wasn't able to get that accepted. There was there was a force inside IBM that wanted MO and not write and not not phase change. Uh, so I so I that didn't happen. About that time uh, uh, Abazai had gone over to Rome. IBM had bought Rome because they thought they had to have Ability to have terminals and everybody's, and you know, through the phone system, that was the way you were in expand computing, so they could, so they could get up there. Now that never panned out for IBM, but that's what their their vision was: is that if you if you were on via the phone, you could get into everybody's house and help and help drive computing system. Uh, the um, Rome was ha Rome had a, a thing called a what do you call it? A voicemail, phone mail. This Rome's thing was yeah. called phone mail, and they had a prime disk drive in it. <laughs> For people who remember prime, and it was a 14-inch disk, one or two platters. I can't remember exactly. It wasn't a very high capacity, but they basically what they they did is they stored voice on to, via digital onto the onto the platter, and they had the software that you know talked to the to the. Uh, well, they they had sold a lot of that into the field. Then the field started seeing problems with the disk drives, and the the, the salespeople would not—they couldn't sell it anymore. They wouldn't sell it. I mean, they they actually stopped selling it. And Abizai had now had this, and they had other—we had other products besides Pomo. But so Abizai was looking to what was his name? Who's the lab director of San Jose back then? Uh, the big tall guy. Um, he he, he said. Uh, his name will come to me, but uh, they, Abizai went to him. This guy used to work for Abizai when Abizai was at GPD. Uh, Abizai, no. Oh, you're thinking of the guy that used to sing or something? 
No. Um, he's up in he's up in Arnold right now. He lives in Blue Lake Springs. Um, but anyway, uh, his name will pop. But um, he had gone. Uh, Abzai had gone to him. He said, I, "I need somebody to, to work with Fallon." And he didn't want to give him anybody because they were, I think, they were doing the thirty nine ninety in those days. And uh, but it, they knew that I was at the. It, Basically, he had just come out of this one area, and and uh, so he came down and he says, "I'd like you to take this job for, with Abaziah. Uh, they got a problem with disc drives. They need somebody who understands disc drives and get that problem solved." So I go, I, I took that because that was the time they were they were doing the layoffs because that was I moved up there in '89 back to to uh, San Jose. Actually, I, I took that job in '88. And and I and I was working the, working the problem, trying to understand what was going on, meeting with customers, etc. And uh, and the, the uh, and Abizai, I'm, I'm getting ready to move, and I, I wanted this the sign ship from Abizai. And he calls me here in Tucson. I was going back and forth, and and he calls me. He says, I can't tell you why, but I, I I don't want you to move yet. And, you know, of course that you know that triggers. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, bells. That says, I said, "Can't tell me why. <laughs> why I can't sign the, you know, the chip that says you can go ahead and buy a house, etc." Well, it turned out that Rome was buying them, and it was secret. I mean, they were, uh, Siemens was buying Rome, and it was secret. They, you know, they can't tell anybody, and he couldn't. So, so they, that finally happens, and he says, "I still want you to come." I said, "Well, I said, you know, I, I don't want to come up here and be a Siemens employee." He said, well, "Well, we'll we'll make it so that uh, you know you can go back when you want." I said, "Oh, okay, I, that might work." I says, uh, I, "I need it in writing." <laughs> I said, "I like that, you know, I like that in writing." And uh, Abizai looked at me and said, "You don't trust me?" "Oh, I, I trust you. I just want it in writing." <laughs> well, fortunately, I had it in writing. Uh, Siemens, Siemens. I had become a Siemens employee for about a couple of years, and. Uh, and at, at that time, there was a lot of the people who were Rome people. They felt they were IBMers, and they and they were getting, they couldn't go to IBM when Siemens, because Siemens just bought them for space. They wanted the market space for their products that they were developing over there. And um, so I was able to come back to San Jose. And Jim Lucky was actually the one that I was my, you know, the manager. I come back in under. Um, what is this guy's name? Just Bob Thompson. Right? Um, and um, the, as an aside on, the, on this Rome full meal problem, what it was was you know, guys, you guys probably all understand that disk drives make errors, right? Okay. Oh yeah. But there are recoverable job security for tape. Well, that too. But there, but there is recovery techniques like retry. You know, just retry it, and maybe it'll read it the second time, or. Well, it turned out that these phone mail guys, they knew how to write software that could write it to the product, and they put no error recovery into the, into the product. So this prime disk drive was just making normal, normal errors, and the, and the phone mail would collapse. You know, it would, you know, it wouldn't read it. And that's why sometimes I thought people got their messages later, because they went to read it, and it was making an error. Remember how you were supposed to be notified you had a phone mail message? Whether you get this, you know, a week later, all of a sudden, there's a phone mail message from a week before. I think what happens is the system finally read it again, you know, tried it. But anyway, so I, I basically just got them to, the software guys to write in the error recovery, got that into the field, and it basically stopped that problem with, with the prime, that was the prime drives. Uh, but the key, the key to that was that it, it was going to stop them from selling the next generation. They had another generation based on the three and a half inch product. And so we, so we basically were able to then utilize and put that same software stuff in the ne on the next generation, and that, and that allowed them to move forward. And I worked at that time. I had, I, I got, a, I put a little group together to work on the voice response systems, and and we were working on voice response. And I said, I told the, the product that at that time I worked for a lady product manager at Rome who worked for Abbasiad. I said, you know, I said, I think my job's done here. I, I'm ready. I'm ready to go back. So that's when I was able to trigger my my right my letter. So about the Priam drive working on the Rome system, uh, to your 
opinion, the prime drive was basically just exhibiting a normal soft error rate. From what and, I could tell, yeah. And a, and a Rome soft there was, error. There was some crashes and such, too. That, But it was the biggest part of the problem was the, was the uh, software not recovering. Fr from, from soft from, errors that should software. be recoverable yeah. with normal right. error recovery right. procedures. Right. Not an uncommon story uh, in the 80s in the PC world. Right. Huge problem. Yeah, because that was basically a PC-based uh, system yeah. that they had. Um, but anyway, yeah, that that was true. So I uh, I then go back to IBM. Fortunately, I have this letter that allows me to go back. And so my my tenure with IBM is like up to this point, and then from this point on. But I have continuity of service from one to the end. It was like you know you got this and you got this because it was like a one and a half to two year skin stint. So, so I got this and this, but the continuity for my pension went all the way through. <laughs> I made sure of that when I, when I went over there. So uh, when I came back, I, 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 I got a job as, uh, as the uh, engineering manager for OEM. And IBM had an OEM, you know, guys might know, OEM to IBM was probably a little different connotation, but it was kind of the consistent of the uh, industry, basically. It was basically we were taking our products, give, uh, selling them to companies who would rebrand them. You know, so they were selling them as their <coughs> product. And so uh, we, we, we did that. We had tape products that were, you know, with on, on other, other uh, companies uh, that we were just m marching through. So is this all OEM products or just storage OEM? Storage or OEM. Storage OEM. Yeah. I worked for a guy named Larry Eichen, who actually was the kind of had the responsibility from a marketing point of view to ha make that happen. But we had an engineering group that supported the products uh, to, with the customers. And part of that, one of the things that happened with in that is the the this was 19 this was probably 91 time frame. I can't remember exactly what year it was. Now, it was around 91. I think the wall. Uh, the Berlin Wall falls in that time frame, you know. The you know the the Russian Soviet Union's breaking up. Uh, Russia Russia's product uh, product management was at the at the bureaucracy, whatever they call it, uh, level, and they would they would tell somebody you you know you get you buy this from Bulgaria. Bulgaria is making disk drives. By the way. Okay, they're they're the disk drive people. Okay, Russia or you know right there in. In Russia, you got the scientists because they were real, real smart people. They they were studying and they knew everything we were doing you know, from the study board. But they didn't understand business because they it was a top-down structure thing. Uh, you buy it from them. They, they told the Bulgarian guys, you sell it, you you sell it to them. You buy it with the money. Here's your money. Buy it from them. When they when the Soviet Union fell, they also said to the to the companies, oh, you buy who from whoever you want. So there were, when I went over to Russia as uh, as an IBM representative for storage on the part of this OEM job to see what kind of business we could do with it, and they wanted I guess they somebody had made set this up, uh, and uh, and uh, what they didn't understand was the business the business model. They might have understood it technically that it was you know costs minus. Uh, Re uh, revenue minus cost to profit, you know, at the, at the generic level. But they, they had no cost structures. They, they, the guys who were manufacturing the Memorex drive, copying, copying the Memorex drive over in Bulgaria didn't know what it cost. They just did it. They just built it. Uh, there was a cost to these guys, but, and, and, they, and their structure for the uh, support structure, maintenance, they didn't have. They didn't know who the these guys who were shipping it didn't know who the customers were. They didn't have. They didn't have a, a support structure for their, from a customer engineering point of view that reported back. They knew nothing about this. So it was. It was like tell us again what, what profit is. You know type of stuff. So I was. I, I went over there and uh, and we. Uh, they took us through the lab. They showed us their supercomputer they were developing and they went over and they showed me. And this is our disk drive. It, what it was was the 3350 design that I had done, but a copy, the Memorex copy of ours. 
So, so they had gotten a hold in Bulgaria, they got a hold of a Memorex copy of the, the IBM 3350, and I was the engineering manager of that, I knew, I knew every little, and I, I looked at, oh, that was, the, that was an error, they just copied our error, you know, <laughs> that type of stuff. And so that was their disk drive. Now this is about 91, and we did, we did the 3350 in 75. They're 16 years behind on a technology curve basis. They're using a 3350, it might have been double density, because I didn't ask them that question, but it may have been a double density. But, it, but, it, but, but you know, we, were, we had gone, at, at that time, I think we were already into RAID, with three, uh, probably five and a quarter RAID products, uh, but at least we were in five and a quarter technologies at that time. So they were way, way behind us on the curve. What time was this? In 91 time frame. I think you were still doing uh, 10 and a half inch. Uh, no, we did five and quarters back Just then. another, uh, I think Sawmill the 3390. Was Sawmill, Sawmill was, was that time. Quarter, wasn't it? Yeah, Sawmill was that time frame. Yeah, but that was, nine, see, we did Sawmill and, and it shipped about 90, about 90 I think. Yeah, IBM had smaller disk drives, but the still, Primary thrust in San Jose, I believe, was uh, 3390 class, uh, 10 and a half inch. Uh, no, I don't think so. Big disk drives. Uh, Sawmill came out. Yeah, you may be right because you probably have a little bit more history of that, but I I don't recall yeah. it being that way. But but by the way, Sawmill is generally recognized as the first MR head disk drive, I believe. Is that right? Uh, don't know. Yeah, it's, I think it yeah, was. I think it was. I it think made it was. the Computer History yes, Museum's list yes. of yes. most significant disk drives, and I think it was for MR head. Yeah, it was MR head. Yeah, uh, it was a five. It was five and a quarter. quarter. Yeah, but that was that was. Uh, I mean, I we had to we had to find it back in yeah. 1980. Yeah, so it was it was probably shifted 80. Six eighty-seven. Yeah. Uh, so it was probably shipping. There were probably double density ones and such that were being on. But anyway, the thing is, is that. It just it was an aside, and it was kind of like, you know, I was pointing out that your your uh, Memorex one was a copy, and I, I saw that same thing over there. We we did negotiate with the Russians to to provide them. They wanted to, they wanted to get some of the new technology. So we I think as I recall, I don't know that it ever came to fruitation, but we we basically had an agreement that they would they would uh, do a I think it was a thirty four I think we were we were doing thirty four. 90s back in that time, and Valencia was our manufacturing site for a while anyway, and I think they were doing 3480s. And what we des decided so that they could have a built in Russia thing is we would sell them a product came out of uh, out of Valencia, we test it, do all the regular things, then tear it down to it through one stage at least. I you know, forget exactly what we did, but they were going to disassemble part of it, ship that, they could reassemble it, and then do a final test on it. Uh, and that, so they were going to get the 3480 technology through that process from us instead of from Bavaria or somebody. But anyway, right. at, at least one term of the art that I've heard used is knockdown kit, where you knock it down, ship it into a country, and they reassemble it as a first way of doing it. But I don't know what, what it was called at IBM. Yeah, I, we didn't have a name for it at that time, but that was basically the, the structure. Um, and then, then after that. Um, I was asked to, uh, I think the next thing I did after that was a weird one, and you want me to get finished? It's getting long. Okay, well, I was trying to give you my total history, it's long. Sure. The, uh, I then did a, I did a job that I was asked to do by the management, which was to kill this program. So I go in and I just start evaluating the program. I said, this program doesn't need to be killed, it's just that we got some redundancy of the of the program with another work going on in Austin. And I get, I get this call, it was right around Christmas. I get this call from one of the, I, think, I don't know if it was Bertram or it was Paul Lowe at that time, but it was one of the presidents says, I want your team disbanded by January 1st. This is over Christmas, right? And I, said, I thought about it and I said, and I, and I worried about it. I get, you just severely worried. I, I don't understand what you might have gone through and what you, especially what you went through is you really worry about how the impact is on people. So I came back to him and said, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I said, I, wanna, I, wanna, I, I had the ability to work with the Austin guys and move half the team at least. And the other half, I'll, we'll try to get packages. They said, oh, okay. they, wanted it, they wanted to cut it off by <laughs> year in so they didn't show this money. Um, so, I, so I did that little job. 
and and then I uh, then then we were we had done, done a product I can't remember the name of it and we actually were shipping it but it was a product that was way over cost it was one of our DASI products and uh, and the uh, they needed a repackaging so they, I was asked to redefine the packaging for this product it was actually the shark it became the shark I forgot the product before shark was it was a product. It was based on the same technology, but it was a different packaging. It was just overly costly, over, over expensive, and impossible to service. So I put together a team and we redefined it in the packaging the technique. And then I, on Shark, and then I was asked to manage it, manage the package. So there was a, a Rick Davis was, he was even like a functional manager. We had restructured the, the labs back in those days at, at that time. And uh, Rick Davis, I forget who he, who he would have reported to, who the lab director was at that time. It, it may have been. Uh, Myers, but uh, the uh, you ran out of no. Oh. The, the, the tape has like six or seven hours. We oh, okay. just one. It's yeah. it's not a tape, by the way. It's a memory card, yeah. and it's uh, good for six or seven hours. The question is, Shark was a tape product? A, no, Shark was a, was a, a RAID product. A RAID product. Right, and it was. I think they called it the ESS Enterprise Storage System. I think it was a, it was announced. Somewhere around 2000, 2002, one. It, and but anyway, it was our we, competitor to EMC, mm -hmm. okay. which just got bought by Dell Monday. But <laughs> so, so the shark system was yeah. and, and it was heavily microcode oriented. It was you know it was basically a controller front end, but it was really the key parts of it. But it was a mechanical system, you know, dual dual power system. RAID. It was you know it, it, it had monstrous power supply. At that time. I, I was given responsibility for, as a functional manager for all the packaging, and, that, and we had packaging, power packaging, power packaging compliance for a number of products, but the, the Shark was one of them, and that and that was actually the last product I did before I retired in 2002, and that's maybe a lot of what I did. You wanted to know uh, where my parents were from and all this. Yeah, stuff. sure. <laughs> it's only 11 o'clock. Um, my mother was born in Hawaii after her. Parents had moved as uh, like a indentured uh, uh, workers from Spain. There was big problems in Spain. Dole pineapple was in Hawaii and needed workers. They they brought people over to Hawaii. Well, my grandparents were part, they came from Spain. My grandfather and grandmother. My mother was born in Spain. You know where? I mean, City? I was born in Hawaii. Oh, I, well, I, and basically on Maui. As soon as that six years was up, I think it was a six year requirement, they moved to California. So that's how my, that side of the family got to California. My grandfather was uh, immigrated from Italy, from northern Italy, up, up by very, very close to Switzerland, the northern part. My grandmother uh, had been adopted by the Rizzi's, which is my, my grandfather, and, and ended up being married off to a Rizzi. Probably one of those put them together type thing. Turned out she was she was Irish. She was Irish and English, and, and from uh, from the from Southern Illinois. And I, I heard learned something yesterday. Somebody said it was Bill Phillips. Said everybody in Southern Illinois had two names. Well, I didn't, I found out why my my grandmother's name was Mary Alma. <laughs> I never knew this. But I always knew her as Mary, but her, but her name was Mary Alma. She was from Southern Illinois from that same area. My my uh, my wife's uh, parents. Uh, her mother was actually born in Italy, came over when she was three or four years old from Sicily. I think it was three or four. Uh, so my wife's first generation on the Italian side. Her father uh, is Polish. She always used to say he was German. But, and I did some ancestry work so, not too long ago. It turned out that the Polish people who came over in around 1860 or so, because he was first, he was born in the United States, but his parents were from, from Poland. But they, they had to write down that they were from Germany because I think Bismarck or something like that owned all of Germany, owned Poland, and they had conquered that whole area. So Poland was basically not Poland until I think after World War II. So, but they, they obviously they thought of themselves as Poland. So he, he always used to say, I'm Polish German. I finally figured it out. So he was really Polish. And they were in Milwaukee. And the, and the Italian, uh, my. Uh, Mother-in-law, they ended up in Milwaukee, so that's how they got together. I have uh, three girls, got twin girls, they're 49. I was born in 38, so I'm younger than you, July 4th, 1938. 
my girls, twin girls are 49. I have a 50, yesterday, 56 year old uh, daughter. And I've been married 56 years and nine months and one day, or something like that. But you're not counting. But I'm not counting. But 56 years I've been married, plus, you know, nine months. So uh, that's probably it. I can, I have more that, that had to do with the development process, but we can talk about that later. Okay. Yeah, our third panelist is John Teal. Uh, John? Share with us uh, your perspective. Hey, Tom, and thanks for the opportunity to do this. Uh, as part of my backstory, I'm just going to preface it by saying that uh, my career at IBM was 31 years of jig technology. I lived it, I breathed it, it was my passion. I warn you, I can talk not just for days and weeks about it, chapter and verse on every product born since 1978, every problem we had. and. Uh, so in a way, my backstory is the story of tape technology from the IBM perspective. So I was born in uh, Alexandria, Louisiana in 1954, which means I only have 60 years of stuff to cover as opposed to Joel's 77 and Al's 105 and it was. Um, my father was the son of a truck driver from Missouri. Uh, my mother was number six of 10 kids who grew up on a Depression-era rent farm, which they lost uh, through the course of the Depression, and her father became a grave digger. Uh, we strongly suspect the last two siblings in my mother's family were probably products of a couple of the older sisters. That wasn't unusual back mm -hmm. in that day. Uh, I mentioned uh, my name is John Teal. Uh, my mother would correct me and say that your name is John Lynn. Missouri also has the two-name tradition, and I have cousins like Mary Beth and people like that. My last name, by the way, is spelled T as in Tom, E-A-L-E, -E, just so I don't have the good day problem. And the silent E on the end is because uh, Teal with an E is a Scottish warrior, and Teal without an E is a duck. So, you'll remember. <laughs> so, my father uh, was a military man. I wasn't in Louisiana long. We went to Kansas, we went to Missouri. Uh, he was Navy, then Air Force. Uh, I, I went to kindergarten and first grade in German schools in Germany because he was stationed there, but we lived off base at that time. I uh, eventually landed in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where uh, I, I finished elementary school at a one base uh, school. Um, Got my public education in Albuquerque, junior high, high school, uh, ultimately University of New Mexico. But before that, I had graduated in high school. Uh, math was my passion. I remember sitting in first grade doing arithmetic. I remember it vividly. I loved it every since uh, my whole life. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, came time to go to college. Uh, I guess I should back up and say that, like Joel, no part of my life was ever goal-directed. It was all serendipity. I was just standing there and something came along and boom. I, I wish it was, but it wasn't. Nothing was planned. I was lucky enough to uh, graduate with uh, high school in the uh, kind of the academic crowd, ambitious crowd that wanted to go to good schools. I applied to Stanford, Rice, and Harvey Mudd. Um, I had a uh, very strong math SAT result and an extremely poor verbal SAT result. So I got rejected by Stanford and Rice because and I saved those rejection letters. Many years later I was an invited speaker to Stanford and I gave the guy that invited me my Stanford rejection letter. It's another story. I did get accepted to Harvey Mudd. Their feeling was if you can, you can teach math people verbal stuff, but you can't teach verbal people math stuff. <laughs> I'm saying I agree with that. That was just Harvey Mudd's attitude was give us the math and we'll do the rest. Uh, at Harvey Mudd, you were either a math major, a physics major, or a chemistry major, or you weren't anything. <laughs> so I started life as a, a math person. Um, Harvey Mudd was the most uh, disappointing year of my life. 
I found out, I thought I was pretty hot stuff coming out of high school, and I found out there's a heck of a lot of really smart people in the world. I was humbled, I was discouraged. Uh, all of a sudden I wasn't the number one guy. I, was, uh, I didn't like the environment. It was a very weird, different, difficult environment. Uh, I came back from Harvey Mudd with my tail between my legs. I dropped out of school. I went to the state employment agency, got a job as a uh, driving a delivery truck. And here is where serendipity begins. The delivery truck uh, that I was driving happened to be for a company called Bohannon Westman Houston, which was a small civil engineering outfit in Albuquerque. So I didn't pick an engineering outfit, I was just driving a truck. And they did surveying. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, I think Rick mentioned yesterday, the very large array of radio telescopes uh, outside of Socorro. Uh, they did all of the ground uh, uh, exploration because all those railroad tracks have to be perfectly level and perfectly stable, and it's, it's a real delicate operation. But in the course of uh, driving that delivery truck, it was a long summer listening to the Watergate hearings in 1973. I was looking over the shoulders, and one, one of the deliveries I made was boxes of punch cards to uh, people who processed them through a computer and gave us printouts back, because that's how it was done in those days. You know, very few people could afford their own computers, so it was all outsourced to specialty houses. I'm looking over the uh, shoulders of the engineers. I'm helping correct their Fortran mistakes. I'm helping them with their geometry and algebra and suddenly realized they were making $35,000 a year and I was making about $4,500 a year. And by the end of that year, I decided that I needed to go back to school. Serendipity. Signed up at the University of New Mexico, started school, uh, math, uh, and became broke. Wandering around the halls one day, I saw advertisement for a uh, a pioneering program from University of New Mexico called Cooperative Education. So I inquired, how do you get into that program? I need a job. And I was told, well, you have to be in the College of Engineering. So I went over to the College of Engineering and said, I want to be in the College of Engineering. I need a job. And they said, well, what kind of engineer do you want to be? I said, well, what kind of engineers are there? <laughs> They told me, and I, I picked mechanical because it appeared to be the branch of engineering that was most robust in terms of mathematical application. It's the only reason I picked it. I didn't know anything about mechanics or I wasn't a motorhead or anything like that. So I started down that path. I took a couple of co-op tours at the Naval Weapons Center in China Lake, California. I worked on uh, ground floor of the harm missile program. I worked on sparrows and sidewinders, mostly uh, wing design, uh, because these were uh, weapons that were uh, going to go to aircraft carriers. So they had to fit into aircraft carrier elevators, and the wings had to be in the packaging with the missile, the warhead. It's all intact. And uh, the idea is that they can yank them up on the uh, deck of the aircraft carrier yank the missile out, stick the wings on, get it under wing, and they got 15 seconds to get that plane back off the boat armed. Fun job is my point. I really enjoyed it. Um, hadn't planned to go to grad school. I was approached when I was a senior uh, by one of the professors who hired me as a research assistant. They don't usually do that until you're in grad school, but he was one of these kinds of deals where I said no, and he said, tough, <laughs> you are. And uh, he got me hooked on that, and it had uh, it was sponsored by the uh, Naval Research, whatever they call it, and it was all about uh, hydrodynamic lubrication in various forms, which is what I became uh, my fundamental expertise. Uh, a couple of months before graduation, I had met my future wife at the time, and she had drugged me to a uh, a meeting involving her church called a friends meeting, more commonly known as Quakers. She was from a Quaker family. Um, so I didn't talk much about Naval Weapons Center at all. And uh, her mother brought a gentleman up to introduce me. I think he might be interested in knowing this guy. His name is William Gross. And I had, in the 70s, it, yes, it was college was common and expected, but not every, I was lower middle class. And, so you know, most of my friends and family had never been to college. I was like one of the first. 
and I tended to dumb down in these things. And, you know, what, what are you studying? I'd say mathematics, or I'd be kind of vague because when I started talking about what I was really interested in, I would get a lot of blank stares and people just kind of walking away. So I, I'm soft peddling this guy, you know, what are you doing? Well, I'm, I'm going to school. What are you doing in school? Well, I'm uh, studying mechanical engineering. Uh, what kind of mechanical engineering? And at this point, I'm looking at him like, uh, okay, yeah, what do you want? He goes, I'm the dean of your college. <laughs> I go, oh, really? Bill Gross? Oh, you're that Bill Gross? He goes, yeah, I'm also the father of gas lubrication in this country. Now I'm thinking, yeah, this sounds kind of like bullshit to me. I mean, nobody's the father of anything anymore. Are they good enough? That was 200 years ago, wasn't it? Well, sure enough, later on when I joined IBM, I did the academic approach. I did a literature review of the head tape interface. And sure enough, Bill Gross had worked at IBM in 1957. He was the first person to add compressibility to the Reynolds equation and resolved the then discrepancy between observed and predicted by Einstein. And he passed away about three years ago. But uh, that was interesting. Uh, that got me to IBM. Um, I became an, I, I joined IBM as a head tape interface guy, which was really a pretty good company because at the time, a great deal of IBM's power structure had a similar background. We had Jack Keeler way up there, an old HDI guy from a million years ago. We had Abizai as our division president, an old HDI guy. So that turned out to work well in my career because I could go to San Jose and not be totally viewed as a Tucson hick. I could, you know, talk the language and yeah, ended up having some very good relationships there. Now I'm going to say the next piece very delicately. When I joined IBM, okay, I'm a kid, I'm a newbie, it's 1978, I already mentioned biggest hiring boom. It also was a shift in how IBM hired. When I joined IBM, the majority of the senior engineers, and I just mean the, the leadership people, not the rank, uh, probably half or more of them did not even have a formal engineering background. It was very common in IBM to, uh, you didn't have to have an engineering degree to become an engineer at IBM. They had a tremendous amount of internal education, as I'll mention, but you also had a lot of CEs, customer engineers that were really good. In other words, a lot of smart people who maybe just didn't have the opportunity. But at the same time, there was I, I sensed a bias against people that were very analytical in their approach. They were, they were very empirical oriented. If you aren't in a lab measuring something, what the hell are you doing? And I was uh, sitting at one of only two teletype terminals that we had that sent a Fortran jobs uh, stream to Boulder for execution, and then we had a remote printer that would print out the result. And uh, there were a certain set of the uh, older engineers that, that felt that I was worthless, and, but there was another set that embraced me. And everybody had their little pet problem, and even though I was there for head tape interface, Reynolds equation stuff, I ended up working on everything. People would call me up out of the blue and say, hey, could you do a, a heat transfer model on an MSS head? Or they would call me up, can you do a a torsional vibration model on a prospector arm. Uh, I've got all these notes I was looking at them the other day of all these fun little things. They look like this. They're all scratched out. We didn't have the tools that we have today. It's all done by hand. And I would say for two years, I had a place. It was just a party. I got to, I just had so much fun working on all this stuff. Uh, this happens to be the uh, design of the 3480 air bearing right here. That's the orifice equation, the bending equation. So this is what resulted in the design parameters. For we didn't have pneumatics in 3480 at the beginning. I might add, in case this slips out, uh, I noticed Joel used the word Saguaro, and then you had to follow up with, when did you start working on 3480? Saguaro was 3480. We uh, had cactus names in Tucson for our, so we had Saguaro became Ocotillo, we had a barrel, we had a, a bunch of cactus products. They're all, think of them as all 3480. Two years later, the party ended. A guy named Andy Godet came to town. Reorganized uh, the entire lab. It was one of those massive, you know, 
throw all the cards in the air, reshuffle everything, and everybody comes to the cafeteria to find out who their new boss is and what their new department is. And I landed in Department 76E, and it was called Integration Technology. And I had no idea in hell what that was. It meant nothing to me. You know, I thought I'd be in a department called Heads or Tribology or Tape or, you know, Integration Technology, whatever that is. And I asked Andy what it meant. Well, you're the glue. You're the glue. I'm like, the glue? <laughs> you know, I still didn't get it. At any rate, I was working for a guy, I had one, there was one other guy in my department, a guy named uh, Armando Argumento. We worked for a guy named Pete Toriello, who worked for a guy named Larry Croissant, who worked for a guy named Bob Hunt, who worked for Andy Day. Two-person department, and basically mission unknown. Armando was an excellent head processing engineer. He scoped things around and said, this is bullshit and went to his buddy Neil Robinson or Robertson and got Robinson. drafted back into the head group where he came from. So now I'm all by myself. A week later, Pete Toriello, my first line manager, quits IBM and goes to HP in Corvallis, Oregon. A week after that, Larry Croissant quits IBM and goes to uh, run a feedlot in Colorado. So now I'm a one-person department, 76E, reporting to a third line manager. And I still didn't know what I was supposed to be doing for a while. Long story short, Andy hooked me up with a guy named George Mauersberger or Mauerberger, who was Mr. Integration in San Jose Disc. And uh, their version of integration, uh, they ran these things called 747 curves, where you look at error rates versus uh, whatever and clocking stuff and for a little piece of, or uh, actually it was more of an off track type of thing, precision test stand. At any rate, I got it and I came back to Tucson and we started building up a whole set of tools for uh, doing similar types of activities where we could manage trade-offs between the, the pain of the head and the pain of the media, the pain of the tape path, the pain of the channel. Blue meant making sure everybody was feeling some pain, basically. Another uh, weird thing happened in 1980 that uh, brought the party to a halt is that IBM decided to try a pilot, and maybe Joel or somebody will remember this, but it was a pilot program to try to identify uh, early young potential leaders. Yes. And it, they had never ran it, they usually ran it with uh, relatively new first lines, but they decided to pilot it on non-managers. It was mm -hmm. very cloak and dagger. I got instructions one day that said, uh, it was on a Friday, they said, uh, you are leaving for a week, you are not to tell your wife where you're going. Uh, we're not going to tell you why you're doing it. I, I learned later that this was all kind of testing your relative maze brightness and could you handle it? Because I guess the life of the higher level managers in IBM was that there were lots of absences, there were lots of secret things going on that they couldn't talk about, I don't know. But it was a bad week. I, uh, I was kind of shy by nature at the time, and uh, I got put in these positions that I'd never been in, these confrontational things, like there's one promotion in the 80, you fight it out, and you don't leave the room till you agree on whose person it is, and uh, these kinds of inner dynamic things that I was very uncomfortable with. Role playing? Yeah, role playing. There was a mailbox exercise, you got 60 minutes, you're the new lab director, you snuck in on Saturday to get a sneak preview and you got your mail out, and back then it was paper, snail mail. And you got 60 minutes to process that mail and there was probably 80 pieces of mail in there, so it was designed so you couldn't possibly finish. And you're supposed to write on there what the action is. And I remember picking up one that said, hi, I'm so-and-so, I represent all the secretaries in, in uh, Building 61 and I noticed on Secretary's Day that all the secretaries in Building 71 got flowers but none of the ladies in Building 61 got flat. So I made a note to myself that said, uh, talk to the HR manager. Actually. This was rough. So the next day, we had these third line managers that flew in from San Jose to sit in. So we're, in a, we're sequestered in a hotel room. In those days, there's no cell phone. So my wife doesn't know where I am. Third line manager comes in and says, OK, I want to go through your mailbox exercise with you. He picks up the secretary one and says, well, have you ever heard of organized labor? 
I'm like, not really. <laughs> Why should I care? <laughs> So he proceeded to give me a lecture on how this was, should have been a top priority thing and that this is potentially a union thing and IBM was all paranoid. So it gives you the flavor of what that class was like. Friday, it was ran by some psychologists at a corporate, facilitated by these higher level managers from San Jose. I got my report card. They said I had a 3% chance of ever becoming a first line manager and a 0% chance of ever being anything after that. So, Anyway, yeah. Did you save that one too? That was a shit year. <laughs> I did for a while. <laughs> uh, we got to work. Um, up until then, you know, the technology organization, we were kind of laid back. We had Bob Hyland's personality. We had Steve Vogel's personality. You know, we didn't get too worried about stuff. And uh, <clears throat> Andy came in with this level of intensity I'd never seen before. For, and that's why I say kind of the party was over because now uh, we need to get to work and start you know, figuring out how we're going to make some revenue. The next big thing that happened, I believe, was in 1982. There was an all hands meeting at the Tucson Music Hall. A guy named Jack Keeler came down and basically told us that it was time to stop screwing around and ship something. And I'm pretty sure he was talking about 3480. Yeah. <laughs> So 1982 and 83 and 84 were basically hell. We had restriction problems. We had guys sitting in chambers sweating at 95 degrees, 88% relative humidity, literally sitting there in their skivvies. They'd take their clothes off before they'd go in the, and this was mostly a guy environment, I'm sorry. It was just bad, it was wild. And uh, it was a war, kind of a war, and eventually it shipped. In 1983, I had the opportunity to go to one of these excellent uh, schools I was referring to. This one was called Systems Research Institute, SRI. It was an internal IBM college without grades. It was in Manhattan on 42nd Street. It lasted three months. You were on per diem. What a great party. Too bad they don't do that anymore. Uh, but it was a real eye-opener for me because I, I didn't know anything outside of tape, and there I learned about SNA and all this other stuff that IBM was into at the time. Came back, and uh, because I had been gone three months, uh, I came back, I was immediately assigned to an ISV task force or something like that. Instant speed variations was a big problem in 3040. Uh, they wanted to make me a manager. I politely said no, and they asked me again, not so politely, and I said no, not so politely, and then they said, you are a manager. And I remember it was Bob Mazza that gave me my first line management pen set and welcomed me to management and asked me why I wanted to be in management and I looked at him and I said, well, I didn't know I wanted to be in management at the time. <laughs> now back in those days, the manager was no, especially first line manager, was no special title in IBM. It was just a technical guy who still had to carry water during the day and occasionally he had some extra paperwork after hours to get people paid and promoted and whatever, recognized, awarded, blah, blah. So I, I continued being a strong technical participant as a first line manager, as Andy remembers. That's when I wrote the end of life model, a bunch of stuff went up. And, uh, and as, as terrified as I was of it, this was part of the serendipity that sometimes uh, outsiders see something in you that you don't see in yourself. It turned out to be a pretty decent manager. Uh, it strained some of my relationships with the technical community because at the time the technical community managers were the ones that can't do. There was a little bit of that attitude, Judge McDowell's, George Adams's, whatever. But that didn't bother me. Uh, one of the things that I made a point to do was not to force my name onto every invention disclosure written by my team like a lot of managers did. And, uh, and that had the effect of screwing me out of a hell of a lot of recognition, but that's okay. Uh, went cruising along, uh, 3480 shipped, and there was kind of a, an air out of the balloon feeling around the plant. There was no immediate plan for a follow-on. There was almost a, let's wait and see if this thing is going to win. Right. So we all kind of scared it off and did a whole bunch of different things. I'll mention a whole bunch of stuff. There was all kinds of stuff going on. One of the things I worked on was a three and a half inch double-sided floppy disk called AHO, it was, uh, held 16 megabytes, had an MR head in it. Um, this was in 1985. Uh, 
Uh, they said that 16 megabytes would not be competitive in 1986, which was our ship plan, so they canceled it. Uh, we did it. Um, as you know, the three and a half inch disc I don't think ever exceeded 1.4 megabytes <laughs> in the entire history of the technology. Was. Worked on a number of pro projects that didn't go anywhere. I, I don't even want to talk about them. They were painful and horrible. Oh, Kino, Kino, barrels, and you name it. Uh, worked on some optical products. I worked on uh, both some ablative, some phase change, some MO. Dabbled in lots of things. Uh, eventually, uh, 3480 gained enough traction in the market. We'll talk a lot more about that later. And I, and I personally think that's attributed to the fact that IBM encouraged industry particip uh, participation. Our business plan never even accounted for making more than 10% of the media demand, so we encouraged media suppliers to participate. We licensed freely or cheaply. We encouraged other drive manufacturers, and, and, I, and if you look at all of the really great legacy storage products, almost all of them, at least in removable media, an element of the legacy is the fact that there was multiple participants providing choice to the customer, providing competition. You do have single point products that were kind of proprietary. I can name a bunch of them. I will later, but uh, so we decided to enhance 3480. <laughs> into something called the 3490E, and I was put in charge of that. It was brilliantly conceived. Uh, not much to it. Double the tracks. Oh, and guess what? We're going to write the other 18 on the way back. Big deal. Eliminated rewind. Eliminated about 20 seconds of rewind time. This was back when STK had uh, slapped us around with the concept of automation, and we were finally getting our act together and doing some automation. And... Uh, Swaps per hour was a big deal. That had to be ready. When the host was ready to talk to you, you better be ready to go. So we, uh, elimination of rewind meant that we could increase our swap amount per hour significantly. We also went from across P, uh, which was not a very robust DCC design, and we introduced Reed Solomon into that product. Those were the two noteworthy things on 3590. Other than that, it was pretty much a no-brainer, as Andy would like to say. Um, there was a task force and research led by the late, great James Eaton. I don't know if any of you remember him. He was a one-time one lab director at San Jose. Who they kept catching him at 3 in the morning, modeling stuff in his office. He could just never let go of the technical, and he landed at Almond in research, and he Somebody put him on a task force and a bunch of people, I didn't even know they were doing it, but they came up with an analysis that says there is a lot of headroom in tape. I mean, you guys are shipping this 3490E 800 megabyte product, but there's a ton of, actually it's 400 megabytes in a ton of headroom, and he outlined the headroom, and, and a lot of the headroom was going to have to be derived from a uh, track following servo, because we had debt reckoning at the time. So I was put in charge of a team, a technology team, to basically explore what this report had to say and, and how might we leverage it. And that effort, I think, was early on known as Summerton or Linden. And long story short, I started that in 88, and it finally saw the light of day as the technology in the IBM 3590 and the IBM 3570 many years later. So I had moved from a front row spectator to basically the coach sitting on the bench doing all this cool technology stuff. And, uh, and then we hit a wall, as Rick has already implied, right around 92-ish. Uh, we had a regime in that decided tape wasn't interesting. And we were starting to exit the tape. And we took our head facility apart, and I remember putting the equipment in big trucks at the parking lot and sold it on the used uh, thin film equipment market. Uh, so what next? Uh, we had temporarily put this 3590 stuff on the shelf and uh, and I was put on managed departure, meaning you are going to be released from IBM. We just haven't decided when yet, but uh, we all kept coming to work and we all kept working because we didn't know what else to do. It was a scary time of my life because I lived like a cocoon inside of the security of IBM for so long, 
I didn't know anybody outside IBM. If I had to go find a job, I wouldn't have known how to start, or, or I didn't know anybody. Well, shortly after that, a guy named Vanderslice came along and changed that whole equation, decided that there was a lot of opportunity in Tate that wasn't being exploited, changed all the leadership, put Barbara Grant in charge, Kevin Reardon became my uh, the lab director and my boss. And uh, we didn't restart the technology right away. Uh, Kevin put me in charge of something called OEM N. IBM made tape drives only for the enterprise, in other words, the mainframe. By then, because of personal computers and the emerging internet, there were lots of other server platforms in IBM. We had the AS100 platform, the old FS that you talked about. We had uh, RISC platforms, we had Wintel platforms, all of those platforms had tape names for backup, for restore, for whatever, and none of those tape needs were met by a $40,000 tape. <laughs> so I was in charge of basically a technical procurement of other people's stuff for IBM, and I didn't think this sounded like a very fun job to go from being the creator of technology to the mere consumer of other people's stuff. And you can imagine some of the early design reviews I sat in at Tanberg Data for a quarter inch cartridge drives. I was kind of an asshole and I'd ask them all these questions and they'd say, you sound like a mainframe guy. We don't worry about that stuff in this space. <laughs> you know? It's a $500 tape drive, dude. I learned a lot, really, really. I also met a lot of people. I met every mover and shaker in the entire universe of tape. I was buying uh, eight millimeter stuff from Exabyte. I met one. I was buying four millimeter stuff from uh, Seagate. I met uh, Shugart at some point. I was buying uh, 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 floppy disk drives from uh, Mitsumi. <laughs> I met everybody, and all of a sudden it was like this whole new universe. And then they brought me back in and said, okay, we decided to get back in the game. We want to dust that stuff off you put on the shelf a couple of years ago and go shove it. That's it. Kevin Reardon replaced uh, JSON? Was that the sequence? No, Kevin Reardon replaced... Underberg replaced the song. Yeah. No, he replaced Friesen. Friesen. It was uh, Friesen. Actually... It was Friesen, then Barbara Grant, then Barbara went over to the business. Kevin backfilled Barbara. Kevin was uh, succeeded by Rick Myers. Then uh, uh, Roger Vogel briefly, Terry Mitchell, Mike Lidicota, not Terry, not his lab director, it was Mike Lidicota and me. So I ultimately became a lab director. So let's get back to right on the precipice of this technology that's been collecting dust. Uh, Kevin and <laughs> Kevin, by the way, is still with IBM. I would encourage you to reach out to him. He uh, lives in uh, Armonk, and he is the uh, chief executive involved in all M&A activity in the IBM Corporation. He's done well for himself. He reports to the CFO of IBM, and he's a good, good friend of mine. Uh, in fact, he called me Friday because he heard you guys were coming here. I guess Tom Bernice had called him. So we had a long chat about what was going to happen here. He was excited about it. He would like to have come. I invited him for the LTO session, but he can't make it work. We didn't have a head team. All of a sudden, we didn't really have a technology team anymore. We had a handful of people that were still here. But how do you get back in the game? And uh, Kevin and Barbara came to me and said, we want to get back in the technology game, but what do we do? I said, well, we're not going to replace a head team. We just wrote off a few hundred million bucks. He goes, well, go to San Jose and figure out how to make a tape head in a disc line. That was my son. And staff head group. I went to San Jose and I stayed there for seven months. Tape was some kind of bad breath little sister to these disc guys. And getting somebody who wanted to manage a tape head group in a DAS decentric environment, I was wasting my time. I was interviewing four people a day getting no's, and then I finally realized, and I told Kevin, I got a problem. Kevin came out and said, all right, I'm going to interview you guys lined up. I said, none. <laughs> I said, I need help. And Kevin says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to feature this job as a belt-notching opportunity for the best and brightest. We're going to sell it to the DASD management as a broadening opportunity for a, a, a rising star. 
it worked. <coughs> so I had people pounding on my door wanting a job as soon as they realized that all their... See, back then, if a DASD person was going to make a job move, they had four godmothers and godfathers they had to go talk to before they could even tell you if they're interested. And I, the career management in San Jose was just ridiculous. We, did, we didn't operate that way in Tucson. I failed to mention at this time that Kevin uh, had a new org and he wanted to do be the second line manager, and I told him no thanks. I'm having a lot of fun as a first line. Called an all hands meeting the next day and announced me in the job. Could have killed it. <laughs> Remember serendipity. So I'm going through all this. We finally get a head team going up there. Great synergy with the DASD team. The LTO stories where all that came together, and we'll talk about it on Tuesday. And I'll just keep moving on here. I'm getting close to done. Um, and we had a number of great managers up there. Uh, there was something called a spin valve head. I don't even know what that is, but there was some gal from research that was working on that, and she had done a technology transfer of it. Shole, something that saw me. She was my first tape head manager in San Jose back in that time period. Uh, we got 3590 shipped. We got 3570 shipped. And, uh, and then we ran against a problem. The problem was the reason tape almost went extinct in IBM in the first place is because, like a lot of places in IBM, our participation was limited to the enterprise. And the enterprise growth numbers were not very interesting. And ever since I joined IBM, they were at the very top of the corporation, somehow maniacally focused on growth. I thought IBM would be a great uh, income stock, but I don't think of it as a growth stock. And uh, what was it, $55 trading value for about 10 years there? <laughs> you know? I mean, it's hard to grow a large company. I mean, let's face it, you got to find white space opportunity, you got to find adjacent space opportunity. It's not easy. And the only way we could grow was to make an open systems tape drive, similar to all the ones that I had been buying. And we had aimed 3570. That was our first lame attempt at an open systems tape drive. And the specific target for 3570 was to hunt and kill Exabyte wherever it lived. And we had some success with that. The problem is somebody else hunted and killed Exabyte before we got the job done. It was a quantum bot, DECs, DEX, storage business in about 95-ish, 96-ish. And there was a diamond in the rough in that portfolio. There was a DEC proprietary tape drive that had never been used on any other system than DEC. Quantum kind of found it in the box of goodies, put a SCSI or some kind of open interface on it. And they, Quantum got a little bit lucky. Not only did they find this diamond in the rough in the box, but they arrived to the market with that just as capacity became king. Up until then, you could sell some performance and you could sell some reliability, but as soon as personal computing and all these other servers, and now the internet is maturing in the mid-90s, boom, the quest for just raw data storage was huge. Boom, quantum was right there with DLT, digital internet tape, and they monopolized the open space. And everybody inside of IBM was envious of that, and they would look at me and, and call me things like stupid, how come these guys can win all this money with their crappy little technology, and, you know. Long story short, that led to LTO, another story for another day. I did LTO for many generations. I wanted to compliment uh, something Al said about roadmaps. Roadmaps are a very powerful selling tool. When you're trying to get customers to change from a legacy format like a DLT or a four millimeter or an eight millimeter. Having a roadmap that has some credible companies behind it is a very powerful uh, change agent creation thing. In addition to job security, in addition to <laughs> all those other things. After LTO, um, again serendipity, I got this idea, was my idea of taking the L LTO engine out and sticking it in something that would handle a cartridge that looked like a 3480 cartridge. The reason that we had failed in the open systems market is because we kept trying to go down market with enterprise stuff. Impossible. 
I know, I tried it three times, I failed three times. But you can take down market stuff, stuff that was designed at a lower cost point. You can enrich the functionality of that, tweak its performance a little bit, repackage it, and you can go up market performance. So internally in IBM we developed a beautiful model. The LTO cartridge does not resemble a 3590 cartridge. You can see that they're not the same size. You can see that one is kind of square and dull and featureless, and the other one is. So this was the original uh, dimensions. This, is, this actually is a 3480 cartridge. This is a 3592 cartridge. We literally took the guts of this cartridge, including its leader pin in here somewhere, a leader pin in there, and stuck it in here. There's a leader pin in there, not a leader block. We reused as much LTO stuff as possible and repackaged it as a 3590 replacement product called the 3592. It was sinfully successful. We were taking something that was uh, at, a, at a base manufacturing cost, LTO's BMC was in the vicinity of 1200 bucks. Uh, we were selling it at Otter OEM channel for about 2000 bucks. We had captured Dell as a customer and they were doing $110 million a year with us. Um, so we had that huge cost base to amortize these lower volumes over. And we put some other special magic sauce in it, but nothing very expensive. And we were able to basically sell the same thing for 25000 bucks over here. All of a sudden, the tape business was just hitting on all cylinders we had. I had, as the director in my tenure, I had... Uh, uh, created the concept of the high density frame and shoved it down my automation engineers' throats. Uh, they didn't want my help, but they got it anyway, and they were amazingly successful because the game had changed. They were still designing to high swap mount per hour library so fast it was a blur. It was taking two hours to write this cartridge, and the pickers over there reading the paperback, smoking a cigarette, waiting for the, the next command. In other words, it was an, it was an archaic requirement. You kick that requirement out, SDK was killing us on something called uh, uh, gigabytes of data per square foot used. And this was a big deal to big IT centers because it's either migrate your technology or build another building as your data grew. And uh, we had all this dead air in our library. Literally, there was a, some cartridges that faced the picker and behind that was 19 inches, an empty 19 inch rack that had to be there for the drives down at the bottom, but it was literally mostly air. And uh, so I had the idea of filling up all that air with cartridges, and we did. We used to work where there was no once one, we now had five. And they were in these long, cool sleeves. We repurposed the picker to not only pick, but to be able to. If you've ever played those puzzles where you get a three by three or a four by four thing and there's one empty slot and you push them around until you get them in order or make the picture or whatever. As long as you got one empty slot in there, you can get any cartridge from anywhere to anywhere else. Just don't fill that last slot or you can't do that. Very exciting. I also threw the baby out with the bath water on our virtual tape system and reinvented it as something called Hydra. The main reason I did that is the VTS was dependent upon something called a uh, SCON channel or FICON channel extender for to go long distances. Think of a repeater. You guys probably know more about it than I do. And the company that we got those from, I won't name them, but they were uh, highway robbers. Um, the internet was now here, so I wanted to get my connectivity through uh, internet protocol. And that was the real reason I forgot got uh, born. It became very successful. At the time I made the decision to step down, uh, we probably had the best P&L in the entire corporation for hardware business. We were hitting on all cylinders. We were making a sinful amount of money. Not only that, but the royalties we were bringing in from LTO alone exceeded our entire development budget. And those were checks that just kept coming and coming and coming. More about that on LTO later. The last six months of my career were about as fun as the first six months of my career. I, uh, in tape, uh, we had a hole in our portfolio. I, I mentioned open systems tape, but the LTO, we plugged the gap. We were OEMing in uh, some low-end libraries, sticking our technology in it, and attaching them to servers. 
we didn't have any open virtual tip. We just had the high end hybrid enterprise stuff. Somebody told me, handed me, told me to go buy a company. To find your problem, solve it, go buy a company. So I identified a couple of targets to buy. And I uh, ended up buying a company called Diligent. They were headquartered in New Jersey, but the workforce was in Tel Aviv, Israel. I was the point man on that entire evaluation. I worked with the corporate M&A people. It was about a $180 million deal. And it was funner than heck. IBM has got this 1500 line checklist of due diligence for doing acquisitions. You would look at cost synergies, market synergies, channel synergies, product synergies, portfolio synergies. I mean, it's just a huge synergy analysis. And from that, you build a business case that justifies the acquisition. There's a business plan you're supposed to manage to downstream. That's where IBM doesn't do so good. They underestimate the resistance of non-IBM cultures to the IBM culture. So I decided to do that full time. I got out of my lab director assignment. Uh, we called ourselves, or we're referred to in IBM as the dark matter, the invisible people. We never go to work. We all mail it in from home. We're all sitting there in front of our computer in our underwear on the phone. Picture that. And I got to work on a project that was top secret at the time, and it was IBM attempting to acquire Sun. And I was the only storage guy on the uh, on the. Uh, project. So my job, basically, there was a piece of Sun they had bought us to kill. <coughs> so there was a piece of Sun that may or may not be of interest in terms of making that an attractive acquisition. And I was in charge of that piece. Well, the portfolio synergy between IBM and SDK products was very easy. I'm going to kick out their shitty tape drives and put our great tape drives in there. I'm going to, you know, eventually we're going to get all that channeled down into one platform. Their high-end disk solution, they were reselling a Hitachi product, they were competing with IBM, Shark, and with SDK, I mean, uh, EMC. Um, the biggest, uh, funnest part of this synergy was this little guessing game of how much of SDK's high-end disk business will IBM retain if they were to acquire some. There's no crystal ball that can help you answer a question like that. There's no analysis that you could do. So my analysis, so I ended up picking 50%, rather conservative. And I'm presenting it to our business leader, Andy Monsha. And Andy goes, John, why 50%? And I said, well, Andy, people buy high-end discs from SDK for uh, one of two reasons. Either those customers hate EMC and IBM's goods, or they love the Itachi product. I said, I don't know how many of those customers we're going to lose when we try to force them to buy IBM product. They'll be able to go directly to Hitachi if they have to. There'll probably be some SDK rebels that will go out and enable those customers to do that. And Andy goes, well, realistically, don't you think it'll be more like 80%? Well, I'm just the uh, technical guy. I said, Andy, uh, you're the one signing up for the revenue, so you write down whatever you want. And he goes, oh, 50% sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> So now Andy is presenting this to Bob Moffat, who was then the CFO of IBM, and this was all, you know, last rock and load, are we going to pull the trigger and try, go try to buy Sun or not? And Andy's presenting my storage chart. And Bob Moffat, I kid you not, he goes, who is the chicken shit that's only signing up for 50% of STK's disc graphic? And Andy Monsell goes, uh, John, are you on the phone? <laughs> So I went through my spiel, Moffat said change that to 80%. And because of the storage piece, the business case did close, but IBM didn't pursue it. And I hope I'm not talking out of school, because I think it is publicly known that IBM tried. Ultimately, they did get sold to uh, Oracle. We didn't know how to monetize all the cool stuff Sun gave away. That's not, how do you monetize Jeff? How do you... Think? How did Sun even stay in business? I mean, you know, we kind of concluded at the end of due diligence that we couldn't even figure it out. So I, I wasn't in the room, so consider that here as say speculation. I wouldn't want somebody accusing me of it. So I retired. Uh, found out right after I retired that I uh, had cancer before I left the business. I didn't know it. That kind of put me on the sidelines for a couple of years. And then I so, so it wasn't the retirement plan. 
It's a little when you've been out a couple of years, a little hard to get back in the game. I came back. I did a little bit of consulting, mostly for uh, venture capitalists, uh, seeking my advice as a storage technology professional. One of them wanted to buy that old holography company. I forgot their name. I told them don't do it. Uh, somebody else was interested in Blu-ray libraries for big data applications, and I said, don't you dare, consumer technology. The last business trip, and in conclusion, I took with IBM was uh, two weeks before I left the business. I was invited as a keynote speaker to a Fujifilm end-user seminar in Cancun, Mexico. Kind of hard to say no to. It's a good work if you can get it. I could do that for a little. And all I had to do was go down and do my tape ain't dead thing that I had been rehearsing for my entire career and get their customers pumped up about new stuff coming. And I had never Googled myself, I had never read my own press, but in preparation for you guys' arrival, I decided to sniff around last week, and what is on the internet about tape anyway? And it turns out there's a lot of good stuff up there that I didn't even know was up there. There's some good Wikipedia stuff on LTO and 3480 both. It's mostly accurate. I'm a purist, I won't nitpick it, whoever. It's a labor of love that somebody did, and they got most of it right, so I'm not gonna criticize it, I like it. I accidentally found myself. Somebody had written an article about this, it's on the internet, they had written an article about this uh, speech I gave in Cancun. John Teal, quote, disk is the most unreliable storage device ever conceived, unquote. <laughs> Accurate quote. <laughs> it's part of the tape isn't dead story, and I wasn't kidding about job security. And, uh, <laughs> there was a lot more to the story. There was uh, data retention, all kinds of policy, government stuff, all kinds of stuff. Uh, one of the th exciting things about 3592 that differentiated it from LTO was that we had built-in encryption at the time. There were tapes getting lost or stolen or falling off trucks. People were having to send free credit reports to all their customers because they didn't know if the data was compromised or just lost. So we had the first storage in-situ encryption device where if you find this laying on the ground, you so we, that's what I meant by uh, jazzing it up with function that doesn't cost any extra money or much. That was pretty broad, I guess. Right. Done. Well, let's, I have some, uh, some questions. Uh, yeah, we have we another have, 45 minutes. We have plenty of time. And, I, and again, I apologize being one of those guys who produce those unreliable dazzies. I don't quite understand. You know, the best defense was a good offense. Uh, <laughs> Indeed. On, so, on two occasions, IBM Tucson attempted to kill San Jose, and both times we almost got our heads chopped up. I mentioned Prospector. Prospector was a spool about this big in diameter, about this long. It had hundreds of 14-inch floppy disks on it. Yeah. It had an arm inside this thing. It spun at a very high speed. It had an arm in there that would inject air pressure to separate two of the disks. Yeah. We had an actuator that would come in and shove the head in there to do some reading and writing. And every time we might have got it a little bit crooked, the actuator arm would rip up and hit the ceiling in a millisecond and the entire pack would shred and we'd have to start all over. Fun project, but think of the business case for something like that. It's basically a slow performing, yeah. flop, floppy version of a DASD array and yep. it, uh, it was ultimately killed by San Jose. Yeah. Aldo thought, I mean, one more time we tried to do it. Got a guy named Jay Hassan, who's been mentioned. He was kind of an optical bigot, wasn't much of a tape lover. But he had the wrong vision of optics. His vision was that optics was going to hunt DASD and we were going to have big platters and we were going to be bigger and better and faster. And as soon as San Jose got wind that we were trying to do that, boom, it came a big kick in the ass again. Okay, pause. Yeah, Andy, just, just real, real quick. Uh, Prospect what came out of the Boulder lab, and Boulder did that, and they were ridiculed for it because all the things that happened exactly what you said. You tried a knife in, and you'd be all off track, and the thing would just fall apart. But it was a from from a te technology point, from a conceptual point, it's what was needed. But it, it, it was just, terrific. It didn't but it really didn't see the light of day that I recall. Right. No, it, it, it got killed in Tucson, but we also, somebody mentioned Spratt Bluegill, I worked on that as well. That was a floppy disk sitting on a platter called a Bernoulli plate. 
although nobody can tell me which of the seven Bernoulli brothers it was named after. Remember, I was a fluids guy, I know a little bit about it. And uh, <laughs> uh, I worked on that, that was a fun project. These were all really cool little things. Remember I said that first two years, I was a pig in mud working on all this stuff. Uh, that eventually left the business and became something called the Iomega Corporation. Yes. And they very successfully sold and marketed that program for a number of years. Several of my workmates went with that. Dave Norton, Tony Radman, people you may or may not remember. Dave Bailey. Can, can I was invited to go there. But it was a little Mormon for me. And that's all I got to say about it. Uh, either you guys, other guys, have comments on Spratt? That was one of my follow-up questions. Joel, I think. Well, Bluegill is the reason I went to Hursley. To Blue, and Bluegill was? I don't know the difference between Bluegill Blue was the name. We changed it. It was called Spratt in England and Hursley before Boulder got involved, okay? And then when we got there, for whatever reason, I can't tell you, the name changed to Bluegill, so those names are somewhat used interchangeably, okay? And I worked for a guy named Jack Hockley in uh, Hursley during the year 1977. We worked on Bluegill brought it back to Boulder in January of 78. At the same time, they announced moving to Tucson, and eventually we took it to Tucson, and it died a sad death, oh, I don't know, six months or a year after we got to Tucson. Oh, a bunch of guys, yeah, took it out of the business. Right. We held it, and then they took it away. Right, and a group of IBMers who worked on it quit IBM and formed iOmega. Dave Bailey was the head of it and uh, a whole bunch of other names. And the Bernoulli? You may want to turn this off for a second. The Jewish boy wasn't invited to join the Mormons. <laughs> <laughs> you got to understand in those days, when I joined IBM, there were two guys that recruited most of the 2,000 college students. One guy was named Steve Bogle, he hired me. There was a guy named Dave he was a channel manager. Dave, oh, Dave, oh, Dave, Oldham. Dave Oldham. 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 Dave Oldham was a senior member of the local Mormon church. So half the new hires were Mormon and half of them weren't. And I remember frequently getting solicited at IBM about my beliefs, which I, given my background of growing up in a colorblind military base all ethnicities and religions I didn't appreciate it very much but mm -hmm. that's kind of how it was then I mean there was still a lot of workplace discrimination of all varieties back there so I are you back on no, you were absolutely we're recording whatever they want with it. no yeah, I so, say, I so, trust them they won't get us I can yeah. do what Joel's holding to Look, let's keep it one at a time please uh, so, actually I think the time sequence is not so accurate. Uh, Iomega and Bernoulli pre-exist Tucson. Pre they go back. No, they, uh, no, no, sir. Uh, well, well, okay, we make we can disagree. Well, and we can do the facts. The, but the, I think the product that ultimately came out of Iomega was the zip drive. Is that what you're talking about? It was a hundred much later. Much, much later. later. Much. Okay. Well, their first product was a Bernoulli disc removable. That, that's true. It's a box about to get big. Mm -hmm. uh, it was invented in an in, in idea. Yeah. yeah, we knew all the guys. When okay. Tony Rattin Actually, I, I would throw my comment. You, you, you are? It was right I around 80, 81 ish that the yeah. Omega was formed. Right. Yeah, I, I got my mind off by a decade. I apologize for it. But okay. you're right, the Bernoulli box with the Bernoulli plate. Right. And that was the Bluegill Sprat right. team. Okay, that's, that's pretty well known in, in the industry. Uh, yes. Perhaps it hadn't been. Well, I don't think it's IBM origins are known. Uh, you know, I don't know what kind of deal we cut with those guys. There's something else that, from my perspective. IBM frequently encouraged people to take stuff and go do something with it if they had decided they're not going to do anything with it. I'll give an example. Uh, Jesse Oweda was no enemy of IBM. He was encouraged to go do what he did. Juan Rodriguez was encouraged to go do what he did. Uh, the people at Iomega were encouraged to go do what they did, and the only thing I can say is there must not have been a very onerous IP 
protection around that stuff, or I don't know how they would have got it off the ground. Maybe a minimum. I remember we investigated that at length and determined, IBM determined that they were not going to take any action. Um, Just look the other way. And uh, a lot of people felt, felt yeah, and to be, that they stole from us in plain yeah, English. But and to be blunt about it, the Bernoulli product was not a very successful product. Um, it was for a while. But not, not a, they really succeeded with but Zip 10, 10 or 15 right. years later. It probably wasn't sustainable. At the time, a lot of people felt the guys who left stole, strong word, stole from IBM. Um, and so there was a lot of work done. Well, and they, there certainly was stuff to people. Yeah. At, at the end, the yeah. powers that be said, well, yeah. we'll not pursue And I have to program. say, having observed that in the late 60s and early 70s, at Memorex, IBM's policy then was very tough on people mm -hmm. leaving to go into at least competitive products, including suing people by name uh, yeah. for uh, misappropriation. Yeah, everything was managed differently then. I remember John Ganevic came from some voodoo optical place and he wasn't allowed to work on optics at IBM because he was firewalled by whatever. You know, I, I didn't understand it. Yeah. Now, uh, Oh, oh, you guys, both of you, I think, per, uh, two of you at least worked on Aho. I worked on Aho. You worked on Aho. This you was were, my project. No, just. He probably he didn't he even know it yesterday. Bradshaw. Oh, he uh, brought it up. He mentioned. Yeah, tell us a little this more about Aho. This was a metal Aho. particle media, our first metal particle foray from Sony. What, what do you want to know about it? There were no double sided three and a half at the time. I'm not even sure three and a half were. I think it was still a lot of five and a quarter stuff in the world. Denver had taken, Boulder had taken a shot at a, a four-inch floppy. Uh, there was some floppy activity up in the Rochester area of Minnesota. Don't remember. I think there was some legacy eight-inch stuff that they had done. Uh, so we decided this was going to be a logical extension of what we had shipped in 3480. We had something called a double bump head, so there was a spherical head on one side and a spherical head on the other side, and they had a point of osculation, meaning where they kissed. That's where the media went through, and we kind of had an actuator that did that. And we had a micro stepper motor for dead reckoning on tracks. Mm -hmm. We had a roadmap to about 80 megabytes. It was a fun little project. Um, the real reason it got killed is that uh, this is almost a little embarrassing, but I'm not telling you. Go ahead. So I mentioned after 3480, a lot of us went off and did fun little projects. And, but unfortunately, there was a guy named Andy Hopper who thought he was a tape drive designer. And he thought he could acquire a metal head from a company called AMC and a low-end non-pneumatic deck from a company called Cypher Data and stick a 3480 head and card in there and produce a low-end open systems attached tape drive that everybody would buy. And he literally attempt to run that program out of finance. And it got a long ways without anybody in development really even knowing it was going on. And then all of a sudden, Cypher Data raised their hand and said, uh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, this is how I got to meet uh, Jerry Aries and Jack Harker because everybody with big shoes in the corporation landed in Tucson to see if we could fix it. Now, from a technology perspective, the reason I'm so critical of Andy is he may have had the right cost equation and some of the right players. But if you go putting the most abrasive tape ever made called chrome dioxide on a soft metal head, head life was approximately six hours. I kid you not. It just mowed through like a bandsaw. And uh, that's what Cypher was doing. And all of a sudden it was all hands on deck to help fix this project became known as Kino my project, this project became a casualty and all of a sudden I was appointed on a gigantic task force to try to save Kino. And this is what I found out what it's like to be a victim of a drive-by shooting. I'm having a lot of fun. I minded my own business. Steve Ward literally was at home with a collapsed lung recovering, called me at home and said, John, I want you to go help this Daryl Johnson guy, whoever he was, and pull together. 
I'm frantically going, okay, let's get rid of the metal head and let's go make a, a ceramic version of a 3480 head. And, and the business guys behind the scenes, I didn't really realize that had made fairly major commitments to AMC and uh, Cypher and AMC and Cypher had taken significant financial risk of their own accord to participate. So we had a little problem. I learned all of this later. Jerry Harris came to town and said, John, you keep working like hell and make your work visible because he was creating a Potemkin village for these companies. In the meantime, in the back room, they were trying to negotiate exit agreements and settlements. And I was supposed to look like we were serious about the product. I thought we were. And at some point, I get a phone call that says, okay, project's dead. You can go find some other job now. I said, what? I mean, I was literally in a technical meeting in Austin, you know, working on the project. Steve called me again. And uh, I found out that there was a big settlement that Jerry, uh, Jerry Aries had uh, negotiated with Cypher and AMC. What was Steve's job then? Bob Island was a victim of that. Uh, there were a lot of people that got hurt. I got called in to be the hero. They called an all-hand meeting, and Daryl Johnson hung me out, saying the reason this thing is killed is because his presentation deal made to, to low. It was the one where he took my foils and threw them on the carpet and ground the heel of his shoe on him. He was so pissed off at what I was saying. He goes, do you feel bad now? And I go, well, I'm a first-line manager. You're a division president. <laughs> I found out later. He was kind of nuts. <laughs> is Shark Ramek? What is Shark? Shark is... Uh, that's what that no, was. no, Ramek is the old original. Shark. Shark. No, no, we, had a, we did have a Ramek. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, we were right, right we before Shark. Shark. And we used reused brand. That was the one that was packaged bad. We shipped it, That's and it had to be redone. And that was a task force that I ran to repackage it and get the cost structure, et cetera. So that's and then, and then that's Ramek. Start. Ramek no. was a very short. I mean, in the current technology, Ramek was, as you know, oh. the name of the very first random access. Right. Memory, some right. kind of but for some reason we reused, reused the it. initials, no, which was probably it. unfortunate. And that product was just a very short. It was kind of like we had, we got to get something out of there to replace that. Okay, so so Ramac I think was the first enterprise class RAID product by IBM. There were there was a RAID product I think on the AS four hundred. Shark Shark was the. But, and so Shark was a complete replacement for the Ramac product? Again, the Ramac, we, we the Ramac more time talking was about a, this. a product that was a cost-effective performance. I mean, a lot of problems with it, and we had to replace it right away. But was it a, did, it was was a, it a repackaging, product. redesign, or a totally new product? Well, That's what I'm trying Shark to Shark turned out to be a new product, but it was... So, it was so a next generation new product. Basically. Shark is a whole story on its own, and you're welcome to... There's a lot oh, I, of semi-dead people in Tucson that work on that. Well, I, 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 actually, I hope we have time to talk about the RAID product but, but lines. At that time, it wasn't the, weren't we very heavily oriented around the, the 3880, I mean, the control unit, cash control? I spent my whole life in tape. I no, no, but I mean, I mean, I don't even oh, know what a 3880 is. As a lab director, <laughs> you guys didn't have, we didn't have data. I, I, I was lab director controllers? of the removal media. Oh. Oh. always had its own lab Oh, I see. Always. Yeah. There was okay. no, they were never the same. Well, okay. you, you guys need to space your discussion apart so it transcribes well. But okay, from I, I mean, point, I, yeah, from a tape perspective, tape is has always been an internal RAID architecture, right. by virtue of its multi-channel and its ability to uh, distribute the ECC. And, and so for us, RAID controllers are like no big deal. But for a lot of people, it's you know the universe, I guess. Yeah, I, I hope we get a chance sometime today, probably late in the afternoon, to talk about the RAID programs. Uh, I'd also like to actually, something you brought up, but uh, perhaps uh, uh, Al or Joel can talk. Also, the controllers, the dash uh, 1113 and then the follow on dash uh, uh, 2123. Uh, pretty interesting products. Now, as I understand it, I'm a little confused. Were, were the, the fundamental 3880 was done in San Jose, but at least the dash 11 and perhaps the 13 was done? They, the, ca the cache controller part of it, basically. Yeah, right. By adding the cache and the software to support the cache. Mm -hmm. I guess the 11 was a, like a read. I can't remember exactly. There's a difference between the 
One was the, maybe the, a fixed block version, the other one was right. a CPA. The 11 was a paging device right. in IBM's terminology, and the 13 was a uh, caching device. Right. Right. Uh, the 11 had a fixed 4K uh, record, but, but it was not, it was not an, an FBA device. Right. It was a CKD device with a fixed key length equals zero, record length equal 4K, and it was used as a paging device for the VM, virtual memories, whereas the the Dash 13 and then the Dash 23 were two caching devices where the data are staged and things like that. Hey, to, to really get into that, you really need a separate set of people. Well, I'd like to hear what you guys and, have to say. Though. Well, we don't really have, I don't think any of us have a they lot to say about it, right. because other than we know, you know, I know I own that space just for a short time, period of time before I went over here, and then I went over here, kind of stuff. But um, the, okay. um, it was, you know, putting putting the cache. Then uh, that whole that whole area allowed for Shark. I mean, because Shark was an extension of that, because you're starting to manage the the RAID functions and such. And then in that process, somewhere in that process, we basically moved the, the storage subsystem stuff that ended at Tucson out of that day. Um, so you know, basically a lot of, you know, a lot, the San Jose development basically started, you know, was basically disappeared in that same time frame. And it became a Tucson uh, product-centric area around the cache controllers. And, and, and the Shark controller was the 3880? Well, it was basically the following. It might have been called 3990 or something That was the like next that. generation yeah, of... I mean, you know, but it's... It's an extension of that with the same type of people. Okay. This is where Rick Conaway and and uh, Daryl Jones oh, yeah. and Hart oh, Tucker should find Hart Tucker. We're just and take Mike tongue will probably be a next thing. So yeah, Mike is still around. You know. Yeah. Um, okay, the other follow-on, well, actually, like a couple, but uh, the one for the whole panel is. Uh, uh, John's comment about IBM business management starting here in Tucson, and I'm sure approved at the corporate level, made the strategic decision to cooperate on media standards. Uh, that uh, is sort of very the antithesis of old IBM, which well, tried to... Well, old IBM, and 3480, Judd McDowell was assigned to take the specification, interchange specifications, right. not the know-how of making to both ANC and Netbook. Because like I said, we uh, what I was told at the time was that we only had capacity to serve about 10% of the 348 market, and we weren't going to build any more. So we <laughs> invited MTECs and 3Ms and TDKs and everybody and their brother ended up making 348. Yeah. Traditionally, IBM wanted 100% of the market, punch cards. Well, for even. some reason in tape, that was not the plan. In, in, I vividly remember that. If before what John's talking about, which IBM had a change of heart, that they, they were a hundred percent, and then wanted to bring in the partners, when they were still at the hundred percent point. Okay. Um, one quick war story. They sent me. Um, Andy and his team was responsible for the media and, and all that, but we still had responsibility for the polycarbonate physical cartridge, okay? But there was a lot of trade-offs between us and discussions and things of that nature. So, and one day I was sent to Atlantic Richfield's corporate headquarters in Wilmington, Delaware, because Atlantic Richfield manufactured the polycarbonate pellet. Okay, Joel, go carefully tell them what we're doing, but don't tell them anything. It was one of those kind of assignments. So I had to go there, and in front of the board of directors of Atlantic Richfield, which was sort of an interesting group of people, in a conference room, I'm going to make this look like a dump, okay, um, I told them a little bit about what we're doing, and the, the chairman of board of Atlantic Richfield turned to me and turned to one of his guys and said, take that boy down and show him what we're doing down in Florida. <coughs> take this boy. So they all finished doing their talk. 
this guy comes over, he introduces himself in a nice and polite, and he says, come on, let's go down to Florida. I said, now? He said, well, yeah, it's only a few minutes over to the, get the, on the plane. So magically we go over, get on their corporate jet. First time I think I was ever on a private corporate jet. I was impressed. Uh, go down to Florida, okay. We land at some airport in Tampa, and they're in near Tampa, and two big black Cadillacs come out, and you know, these guys come out, and it was just me and this other guy that went down, okay, but took two cars to take us. We went over to this big injection molding plant, okay, and they wanted to impress me with their injection molding capability, thinking before what John's talking about, where you want to break it up, that they could make all the cartridges. They had like two or three injection molding machines. They couldn't, and maybe they were each capable of um, maybe doing 16 or 18 at a time as far as the size of the mold goes. Mm -hmm. Okay, no way in hell could they even come close. And, and uh, I remember coming back and I said, be nice for model parts or something of that <laughs> nature, which is about what this particular company's capability was. I'm not bad mouthing, but that's what they were. And uh, it wasn't long after that that after they started doing the arithmetic, they came to the conclusion we better find some partners to make this thing because no way in the devil are we ever going to make them all. Another little interesting tidbit about this cartridge on the subject of the plastics. Um, when I joined IBM, IBM was wanting to lead American industry into the new universe of metric measurements. Oh, yeah. 24. I came out of college, all I knew was metric. I didn't actually know the English system units. That's what they were teaching in college. I came into IBM, everything was in metric, or most stuff was in metric. Unfortunately, nobody in the industry followed IBM. Subsequently, when I was working with vendors, we were constantly spending more time in our meetings transferring millimeters to how many mills is that? You know, <laughs> and I'm like, at any rate, and one agree, of the, and agree upon the tolerance. One of the cool things, the way this cartridge is retained, that's called a brake button. You see a, uh, some ridges, and that's what the motor clutch engages to spin it. But this thing is locked by that brake button. There's a, a, sl a thing that sticks out of the top of the cartridge here. The brake button has a uh, slot in it, so this will not rotate unless that button is pushed completely to the top. There's a spring-loaded thing in there, and then this thing is free to rotate. I remember early days of IBM walking into our labs and hearing this screeching all over the place. It was the screeching of these brake buttons mechanisms. And this was designed, somebody said it earlier, to be four by five by one inch, but we had to convert it to metric. And if you measure this cartridge, it is 24.5 millimeters high. Used to be 24. Right, no. Uh, we even know who made that error. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to tell you his name, but I will tell you that I exited from him from the business. <laughs> but but none of, all the other dimensions were transposed uh, correctly. And this. so that was this brake thing pushing up against this thing, kind of semi-engaged and semi-disengaged, and it just made an awful record. So, um, and we ended up changing the uh, design of the brake slightly to uh, get some clearance. That's actually a great segue into... Uh, uh, another set of follow-up questions for you, John. Uh, so that is a 3480 cartridge. It says 3480 right on it. Right on it. It's an okay. Original. Now, what's the yellow thing? The yeah. golden thing in okay. front of this you? This is an LTO cartridge, but it's, it was actually, uh, this is not how LTO cartridges appear when they're shipped. Um, this was a cartridge presented to me by the IBM Japan team as a Mm -hmm. Thank you. So they have they're gold. They're gold. They're gold they're plastic. Them. But it's physically an LTO cartridge. It's a real LTO cartridge. And they you know, one of the things was, so we did this for LTO, and, and why didn't we just use this cartridge? Well, IBM wanted to. But you'll hear later that HP and Seagate had very good reasons for not wanting to use this cartridge because they had their eye on a business opportunity for half-inch, half-eye tape cards. This would not enable 
deep dry that that this does barely. And uh, there was a lot of arguing about the design of this. Ultimately, this is a design by committee, and it has some uh, ugly things about it that clearly were designed by a committee. But one of the interesting things is when I wanted to take this technology and put it back in the high end, I talked about that, the, what became 3592, I had to sell this to a guy named Walter Reisner, who was our business leader at the time, and my boss from Germany, right? Right? Charles Lickle. Walter's on the phone and says, what's this about, you know, you got a, you know, a new cartridge? Because we had, to, we had to reinvent the 3480 cartridge to replace that leader block with a leader pin. So this is a leader block. Pops out. It was a source of much pain to many people because it's very poor to design. This is a leader pin. There's a pin in there that you grab. Just like the LTO cartridge has a leader pin. So in order to take as much of the LTO technology and port it, if you will, I hate to use the word port it because as a te technical person, Nothing ports, but program managers love that kind of term. It sounds simple. So, um, sorry, Joel. So I'm trying, and, and so and Walter is not getting it. He is not getting. Well, I'm not getting the third cartridge you held up. Is okay. it had to be? It's the it's 30, even stackable. 3492. It's the 3492. Oh, but we wanted to use the LTO engine, so we had to take that leader block off, and there, so there was some mm -hmm. money we had to spend to re-engineer the 3480 cartridge without it changing any of its external physical interface because it had to go into existing automation. Right. And the existing automation in the enterprise didn't take this cartridge because this wasn't in the enterprise. So I'm trying to explain this to Walter Rice. And he goes, well, I, I don't understand how can we can't just use the LTO cartridge. And I said, Walter, do you have an audio cassette player? Yes, I do. I said, do you have a video cassette? Player, VHS. Was, yes, I do. So can you put your audio cassette into your VHS player? And he goes, <laughs> of course not. Can you put your VHS cassette into your audio player? Of course not, you idiot. I'm like he's making my case here. Now how do I how do I close the deal and get the money? <laughs> well, it's the same problem, man. <laughs> so you have a bunch of other. Uh, this, uh, I wanted to illustrate, earlier I talked about how once upon a time uh, performance and reliability had some value in the open systems, and Exabyte took advantage of that. If you recall, these were cute little storage products derived from consumer technologies, so there was 4 millimeter uh, audio DAT, and HP and Seagate uh, conspired to convert that into DDS, which was the storage version of the audio so they were porting a technology engine. Same with uh, the 8mm, that was originally a video recorder, which got converted, but it's a digital video recorder, so it's not a big leap of imagination to convert that into a more generic storage device than just video content. That's what Exabyte did. Tremendous. Uh, the problem was, as I told you, the capacity requirements weren't that big prior to personal computing on the internet. So there were a lot of these dual reel cartridges in the market, including the four millimeter, the eight millimeter, quarter inch cassette. This happens to be a 3570 Magstar MP with the mid tape load. The whole idea is you get a really simple drive, you just shove it in here, you don't even need a tape path. You GM two motors in there and it goes right onto the recording head, you're locked, loaded, ready to go. It's fast, it's efficient, it's relatively cheap. The problem is, Quantum came along and inadvertently changed the whole mid-range equation to capacity and cost. That's the only game. This is very limited on the number of square inches of tape you can put into approximately the same space as a single wheel cartridge. So all of these little two dual cartridge things, every single one of them is extinct as a storage device. I don't have a DLT cartridge with me. It's a really super ugly cartridge. Looks a little bit like an LTO cartridge. Um, kind of clunky, uh, squarish. This was intentionally made a little bit longer than it needs to because people then had to shove it in. To the, you needed something to hold on to to get it in and out. And 
and uh, so that's what that reference was all about. Quantum really changed the game, and that's why this was too little, too late. And that's what that's what propelled us to the idea of the concept mm -hmm. that we talked about. There's the, 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 the other thing I wanted to mention on the STK deal, the synergy was so cool. I was looking for I, I had the whole thing reduced to 15. Uh, what do they call it? Sustaining engineering team for legacy SDK products. And I was going to burn the factory down. That was the business plan. <laughs> you you, have, even, a, it even with it, huh? you and, have a piece and, of. By the way, I left IBM when that deal fell through because. Yeah, let's uh, let's just, try to wrap up. You have a piece of tape there. A well, this is an old MSS. I didn't know how much technology we were going to talk about. MSS was a super product, way ahead of its time. I barely worked on it. I worked on the heads on this project called Delta, where we were trying to put another head in the loader and do something with it. I was first in automation. It was first in a whole lot of virtualization elements. Yeah. Clearly had a different uh, form factor of tape. That is the tape, a yeah, piece of, a segment of tape, tape from that cartridge. Yeah. These guys probably know a lot more about it than I do. Can you see the, the diagonal stripes on it, John? Yeah. It was a helical scan recording device. Show. Rotary scan, whatever you want to call it. I don't know if you can see it. Or not. There's no formatting, though, right? Is there, or is it, is uh, there, it, no, it was dead reckoning, just like all the. All right, so the, the head itself was riding the truck? Uh, yes, yeah. and it was doing it. it there, there's a difference between helical scan and roll, rotary scan, and it's a very subtle difference. I'll try to explain it. You've got a round drum with head or heads, they're coupled inductively out to the channel, no wires, obviously. If you step this tape, scan it, step it again, scan it, that's called rotary scan recording. You're stepping the tape and then the tape is fixed as the head swipes by. If you're continuously moving the tape as you're writing it, that's helical scan recording and you get a slightly curved, very slightly curved result because the tape is moving. Not that that's a distinction anyone cares about. But I'm pretty sure this was a helical scan. Yes, it was. Recorded device. Yeah. Way ahead of its time, STK came out many years later with, uh, they called it Redwood, we called it Deadwood. One, one of the sides <laughs> of that piece of tape seems to have the scans visible. It might, I don't know. Uh, I, maybe there's been some developing fluid dust on there at some point for some general purpose. Or yeah, there's a, I don't know if the camera can see it, but there's a definite. Uh, diagonal stripe here about that long mm -hmm. and there's also apparently something recorded on both edges top and bottom which so it appears no. maybe this has been a developed piece of tape the, somebody's the, put the two edges my memory's right are basically wear marks well, okay could could be wear marks uh, but i mean you can clearly see a, right. a, a scan path there was nothing the, the head John's describing is the only head, so there was nothing recorded longitudinal, it was all helical. Okay, and single head, well, single track or multi track? Single head? track. Single track. So those are multiple. Yeah. Oh, that's got to be a whole bunch of tracks. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, just another artifact. Uh, I can tell you what this head is, if anybody else can. This is a graded exercise? Yeah, there'll be a test later. This is a 3590E head. E. The reason you can tell is the 3480 head only wrote out and rewound. Had a write module, a read module. As you wrote the tape, you did an immediate read back to make sure you recorded it. You got all the way into the tape, you're done. You rewound it, put it away. 35, 34, 3490E, I already mentioned, we decided to stick 18 more tracks interleaved with the 18 out and write 18 more back. So now you needed two cables out of each module because each module now has alternating write and read elements in it. The other way you can tell is if you study that contour, I can see that there's a dual rows of line slots on both modules because I designed that. Okay. Is it a single head with a staggered uh, read writes one each way on that head? Uh, not, this head has 18 writers with 18 readers on the other module out. And then there's 18 more writers sandwiched in between the 18 readers coming to back. write and read coming back, and, and, and then, then no rewind. No rewind for the product. Now, one of the problems we found is that sounds like a brilliant idea. We subsequently did some analysis. So now we're talking more generically about 3480 itself. We did a 
study once because we wanted to understand if we had the right market requirements. We had shipped 200 megs, we shipped 400 megs, now what? Did this big study and guess what we found out? The average enterprise customer wrote 20 megabytes on a 3480. And guess what? System 370 JE at JCL and TSO had a one-to-one -one correspondence between a tape volume number and a physical tape piece of tape. So what we found out is why do we have a uh, 100 megabyte cartridge in our roadmap when these customers are writing 20 megabytes of data on average, almost nobody ever fills up a tape. This led to the invention and creation of something called virtual tape. So the idea of virtual tape was that I can take this cartridge, this physical cartridge, and I can assign, I can associate many logical names with this physical cartridge. I can concatenate that stuff. And I can fake the host out. It thinks it's asking for a unique physical volume, but I've got a translator in the front door. Oh, he wants that one that's sharing 16 of them. And, and that virtual tape system had to be disk cached because we would stream all that stuff to disk so that we could make sure that this tape had room for that particular one before we appended it onto the tape. A number of benefits because all of a sudden tape customers suddenly experienced what appeared to be disk-like performance, even though it was fundamentally on the back end a very large tape device. They got the benefits of utilization of media, which was a huge customer value proposition. And I'll conclude with that. Like I said, I could talk about this subject for well, how the about, rest of your life. How about just talking about that reel of, of tape, well, small reel of tape to your right? I just brought this in case nobody knew what they look like. I mentioned that there's there's a braking thing in here where the brake button comes through in a spring. It's inside of a... I think there's sport. about a mile of tape on here. I don't remember. Uh, I think the dimensions of this was always fascinating. I don't know if Rick discussed it, but the thickness of modern tape is approximately the tenth of a thickness of a hair on your head. That's how thin this stuff is. Unbelievably thin. Uh, less than a thousandth of an inch modern uh, tapes. And yet it is almost a mile long and a half inch wide. It's a little bit like the solar system. It's hard to draw. <laughs> you know, to scale. Yes. Uh, because the scale is just so weirdly out of proportion, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But I, I had no specific purpose. This is just the guts of a 30 foot coverage. 